you have that opportunity to get out of here before midnight if we get started. Colleen, will you get control of the upper deck? Good evening, everyone. This is the March 21st, 2018, Denver Regional Council of Government's Board of Directors meeting. We'll call it to order at this time, and if you would, please all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Garcia, would you please do us the honors? Eva Henry, I managed to get a microphone away from Denver, so yes, I'm here. <laughs> Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. David Breakham. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Fanganello. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, Tina Francone, Bob Pfeiffer. Here, but I can't use Bob Roth, Allison Hills, Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Ann Justin, Lynn Baca, Tara Radloff, Roger Hudson, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Tammy Maurer. Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, yes, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Jim Dale, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Here. Jacob Lofgren, Here. Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Jessica Sandgren, Jackie Phillips, Herb Atchison, Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter, and we do have a call. Randy Wheelock. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we move to approve the agenda, we're going to ask to move one item out of sequence. We're going to move item 12, the presentation on CDOT Smart Mobility Plan, will be moved up to the uh, agenda right after item 5. So when we move that, just make notice that we've made an um, amendment to the sequence of the agenda for tonight. At this time, I'd like to uh, ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motions carried. First item on our agenda tonight is the public hearing on the amendments of the Metro Vision Plan and the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Herb Batson, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I thank you for all coming tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the proposed amendments and updates to the Metro Vision Plan and the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and Associated Air Quality Conformity Documents. Public hearing of the regional, Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decision will be made and no action will be taken tonight related to the public hearing. Receiving public comments is important to the board's decision making process. Anyone wishing to speak should have either registered on the sign in sheets on the table, and at this time we understand there are none and should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog's website or by phone. All comments received by email, Dr. Cog website, or in writing have been automatically included in the public hearing record. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. 
Board members are free to ask questions. Are those testifying? Mr. Calvert and Mr. Rieger of Dr. Cog staff will now summarize the proposed documents. Mr. Calvert, if you would. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Brad Calvert. I'm the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, here at Dr. Cog. As was mentioned, I'm in the Chair's opening. Uh, both Jacob Rieger and I will sort of give the Board as well as uh, the audience an overview of the amendments that are, that are ultimately, again, not for action this evening, uh, but will be considered by the Board um, at your April meeting. Uh, a little bit about um, the documents associated with this. Um, on the screen are the documents um, that were prepared for the public review process um, and the subject of tonight's uh, hearing. Uh, in general, I will cover the first bullet, um, amendments proposed to the MetroVision plan, and, and, and my colleague Jacob Rieger will, will, will handle uh, the other documents that are, that are noted um, on, the, on the screen. Uh, so this, the documents related uh, to this hearing really hit two of the m more foundational pieces of work that we do here at Dr. Cog. Uh, the first one at the, you see on the top of the slide, the MetroVision plan, which is, as you all know, uh, is something that I spend a fair amount of time talking to you about. Um, and obviously the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan as well, which, which uh, Jacob Shop handles. So two very important pieces of the work that you do here uh, at Dr. Cog. Um, a little bit of background, uh, so as noted um, in both the materials that you have in front of you as well as the other hearing materials that were prepared in advance of tonight's hearing, um, a big piece of the proposed amendments are related to the MetroVision plan uh, that was adopted by the Board of Directors back in January of last year, uh, but it has been the process of the Board for many, many, many years, uh, over 20 years, to regularly revise and have a process to um, have amendments considered as part of the plan, both minor as well as sort of major uh, amendments. So this continues that, that legacy. Um, you will see in the presentation as well as in the materials, there are really kind of two very basic types of amendments that are proposed. Uh, what we consider staff-initiated amendments, where staff has spent time with the plan and wants to bring uh, forward uh, amendments for the public as well as the board to consider, as well as um, uh, other amendments that are ultimately initiated by other entities, whether that be member governments, RTD, CDOT, um, key stakeholders uh, as part of our planning process. So this presentation will include both staff-initiated as well as uh, member or sponsor-initiated uh, amendments. Um, staff has one uh, uh, Staff initiated um, amendment to the MetroVision plan, uh, and I'll cover this over the next uh, few slides. Uh, so uh, really this is a, a, a proposed amendment, again, initiated by Dr. Cox staff that really adjusts um, the, the name and description of a performance measure. Uh, the plan includes, as adopted, includes 13 performance measures. We are suggesting uh, an adjustment uh, to one of those performance measures. Uh, really, the, as noted on the slide, the updated language related to the name or description of the measure, measure is simply to try to make it more closely linked uh, to the uh, methodology that's actually used to, put, to uh, evaluate and, and perform analysis to create um, observations related to the measure. Uh, there's a lot more detail about this um, in uh, the materials prepared for the hearing as well as the overall public review uh, uh, periods. I won't uh, belabor the point and, and we'll just mention uh, that this was actually something that was discussed at the February work session by the board, both the amendments to the, to the measure name um, as well as this next piece, which were uh, proposed amendments from staff related to uh, the baseline uh, observations for this measure um, as well as 2040 targets. Uh, as noted um, at the February work board work session as well as in the materials prepared for uh, the public review period. Uh, really, this is ultimately based on a staff error in calculating the baseline back in the 2013-2014 uh, time frame and, and thinking about actually doing uh, measurement related to the plan. We discovered it and really thought it was important that the board um, ultimately correct that baseline uh, as well as uh, the associated target. And again, as noted, uh, with the other uh, portion of this amendment, there's a lot of detail as to how and why we've come to this point um, in the materials. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, um, but otherwise I will sort of continue. Um, also related uh, to the amendments are, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, the, the, the process allows for uh, sponsor or member or stakeholder initiated amendments to the plan. Uh, and in the case of the MetroVision plan, we received four uh, Member-initiated uh, amendments uh, proposed, all related to uh, urban centers that are recognized uh, in the MetroVision plan. We received 
uh, three uh, proposed amendments for pretty significant boundary adjustments to existing urban centers that are already with, um, in the plan, as well as one new proposed um, urban center. And the, the note that you see at the bottom of this line, slide is important. The board previously established kind of a review process associated with urban center amendments uh, that really um, puts the, the overall evaluation process sort of on the front end uh, with Dr. Cog's staff as well as with an external evaluation panel. So that's something that the board previously gave direction uh, to staff in terms of how to review and evaluate uh, these proposals. So as I noted, currently um, there are 104 urban centers recognized and the, and the plan is adopted by the board uh, back in January of last year. And so this includes three uh, again, boundary revisions to existing centers, so you can see those three here, as well as one new um, urban center, the National Western Center, uh, as proposed by the City and County of Denver. And I'll, like, same with the others, there's much more um, detail um, about each of these proposals uh, and the information provided, uh, but I'll step through them just very quickly. Um, so the East Colfax Main Street um, Urban Center is a currently designated center. Uh, in the Metro Vision Plan and simply the City and County of Denver proposed to move the eastern termini of that urban center from its current um, uh, stopping point, basically Colorado Boulevard, um, all the way out uh, to Yosemite. Uh, we also have a proposed amendment from Douglas County related to the Highlands Ranch uh, Town Center. Uh, to so the, the, this is the existing designated area you can see in this sort of hashed um, area and Douglas County is proposing to ultimately expand uh, that this designated center to include um, additional focal points for urban development within the un unincorporated portion of Douglas County, uh, including uh, areas surrounding a planned transit station. Uh, there's also proposed, again, you can see pretty significant boundary expansion um, from the city of Inglewood. Uh, they are proposing to expand uh, the city center uh, area to include other districts that were recently analyzed as part of the city's comprehensive plan update. The proposed boundary um, from the city includes all three of the city's most inclusive zoning um, categories are, are really included within this area, so they thought, they thought it important to sort of think of it uh, holistically within the, the context of, of MetroVision. And then finally, as I mentioned, there is one uh, new proposed uh, urban center that was submitted as part of the amendment process, and that was for the National Western Center, and that was submitted by the city and county of Denver. So as noted uh, in the presentation as well as in the materials, uh, staff really has evaluated uh, these as, as the proposed uh, urban center amendments along with uh, an external um, uh, review panel. The public review materials include a preliminary staff uh, recommendation based on that conversation with the external review panel as well as staff's own um, uh, evaluation that we consider those recommendations preliminary. We do, as the chair mentioned, value sort of the public review and comment period. So when the board sees this for final action in April, it will include a final uh, staff recommendation related to these four particular uh, amendments. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jacob to handle uh, the Regional Transportation Plan and other associated documents. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacob Rieger. I'm Dr. Cog's Long Range Transportation Planning Manager. So the other major document that's the subject of the public review period and the public hearing is our Long Range Transportation Plan, known formally as our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. What is this plan and what does it do? <clears throat> it does several things. It is one of the foundational documents that we work on at Dr. Cog, and it's one of the primary ways in which we help to implement MetroVision. So it has that very close tie to the MetroVision plan uh, that Brad just, just presented on. Um, the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, it presents our region's vision for a multimodal transportation system through 2040. You know, what do we want to be when we grow up? Um, not the least of which, it does meet federal requirements. Um, it is a federal requirement to have this long-range transportation plan, but the plan itself also meets uh, several federal requirements. Within the plan, it identifies not just the vision, but it also identifies what can the region collectively, you know, federal, state, local revenues, what, what can we actually afford to pay for in terms of investments in our transportation system through 2040. We call that the fiscally constrained or the cost feasible uh, portion of the plan. And as part of that, it identifies, um, individually identifies major roadway and rapid transit um, capacity projects. We actually um, illustrate those in the plan, um, as well as sort of system investments in, in project funding type categories. We update the plan every four years and we amend it more frequently, which is what we're doing tonight, uh, sort of a typical kind of routine amendment cycle to the plan. 
Um, so this table, which is also in the materials, it's a little hard to read here, but it was in the materials. Um, and uh, you all as the board saw this actually in December because you approved modeling these amendments for traffic and air quality conformity. These are the amendments that we received from project sponsors. These were requests from project sponsors to either add, delete, or change these projects in the existing 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. And they are displayed here on this map. Um, really, there's kind of three types of amendments that were, uh, that were requested of us through this process. Either adding new projects, and we do have a couple new projects, uh, probably most significantly uh, the I-25 South project uh, shown here from Castle Rock down to, um, down to the El Paso County line. Uh, Denver International Airport um, also asked for a project on Pena Boulevard relating to roadway capacity um, on Pena itself as well as interchange improvements at Jackson Gap. Um, so in a couple more projects, new projects proposed to be added to the plan. Uh, a couple of projects that uh, local government project sponsors wanted to remove from the plan, and that's not unusual. That happens every so often. Um, you know, things change. Local government says, hey, we want to, you know, we want to remove this project. So we have a couple of those. And then we have a couple of projects that were already in the plan, um, but the project sponsor asked to change the air quality staging period. Basically what that means is that for all the projects in our plan, uh, we have a 10 or 5 year window uh, for conformity purposes, air quality conformity purposes, in which we say, you know, what's that window that we're going to slot that project between now and 2040. Um, and a couple of these, the project sponsors asked to change that window really to move the project up. I do also want to note for transparency, and we talked about this back in December uh, when you as the board approved these projects for uh, modeling and for air quality conformity. Um, due to some federal regulations that I can bore us with if you want to hear it, but basically due to the calendar currently in the plan, we have three of those air quality staging periods. We are proposing to go down to two staging periods. Basically, we propose to go down to periods that would cover 2020 to 2029 and 2030 to 2040. So that's administrative in the sense it doesn't substantively affect the projects in the plan, it doesn't affect their implementation, but it is a change in the way that we illustratively portray them in the plan, and I did want to note that as part of this process. Um, just as Brad noted for the MetroVision plan, uh, staff is leveraging this amendment cycle process to uh, propose some staff-initiated updates to the plan as well. Um, on the regional transportation plan side, uh, several things listed here, and I won't go through every single one, but really sort of the high-level concept is that um, we wanted to fully integrate these amendments in the plan. And what I mean by that is that our past practice has been whenever we had a routine amendment cycle, we would produce what we called as a summary report. And it was very handy in terms of identifying what was changing in the plan. So that was good. What was not good about it is that the plan itself, once it was adopted, didn't change. We didn't go back and revise the document. It sort of, you know, aged over time and started to become outdated. And then we had these sort of separate summary reports that kind of had to go with it. So the approach that we're doing this time is to actually fully integrate these amendments and changes into the plan. So as it says, fully integrating the amendments into the text, map, and tables of the plan, um, updating the financial plan for those new projects. Uh, the expenditures and the revenues associated with those projects because that's a federal requirement. Um, when we had updated data, we, you know, we re-ran our traffic model, we have another year of census data, we have other data. Uh, we refresh the data in the plan to keep, um, there's a lot of data uh, snapshots, a lot of data information in the plan uh, to keep that up to date. Uh, we also updated the text. I mean, it's amazing how much in one year things can start changing. We originally adopted this plan in April 2017, so here we are literally a year later. Uh, so we went through the text and just kind of made some, some updates, you know, to make, uh, make the plan more relevant and to keep it current. Uh, and then finally, um, we're also, in, and you saw this in the materials if you clicked on some of the links in the, uh, in the memo, uh, we're creating a new style format and graphic design to make the plan more attractive and user friendly. Uh, so when we adopt this plan, it will actually be a plan that's gone a really uh, heavy facelift in terms, of, um, in terms of its format and design. And I think it's something that really looks a lot better. Um, our communications and marketing staff have spent a lot of time on that. Um, so we've talked about public input and, and the chair's remarks at the beginning of this process. Um, as is our standard practice, we've had a 30-day public comment period. Um, today is the 30th day, the last day, and this public hearing is actually the capstone to that public review uh, process. Um, as listed uh, on the slide here, there were several ways in which we tried to reach out and, and, and sort of notify people about these documents and about this public comment period um, and advertising the public hearing. As I said, the public hearing is the capstone to our 30-day uh, public comment period. 
Um, and as the chair noted, um, we'd like to, um, in an ideal process as we're doing tonight, have this public hearing separate from any board action. We just want to listen tonight and we want to get input um, and then we'll come back to you in April to ask you to make a decision on this. Uh, we did not receive uh, any comments in the 30-day period leading up to this hearing. Um, finally, I've mentioned air quality conformity, one of the many federal requirements associated with the plan. Uh, so I did want to touch on that. As part of the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, we do need to address several criteria pollutants listed here, ozone, carbon monoxide, and what's known as particulate matter, or PM10 as we call it. Um, the proposed amendments that I showed you earlier in this presentation, we include those in the regional, tra tra regional travel model transportation networks. So they become part of uh, the entire plan and, and all the projects in the plan. Um, so the good news here is that the, the plan as we're proposing to amend it and update it, the amended 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan does pass the pollutant, pollutant emission tests for regional air quality conformity. Um, so we've met that federal requirement. And I would note that in this process, air quality conformity is regional, meaning that the entire plan and everything in that plan, the projects in that plan together, that network that creates our 2040 plan, um, is what's subject to air quality conformity. This is not an analysis of individual, individual projects within the plan. So I do want to make that distinction. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, that is the information that we have to present as part of this public hearing, and we'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rieger and Mr. Calvert. At this time, I will open up the public hearing, and I will ask that each speaker uh, who comes forward tonight uh, contain their testimony to three minutes. If you have not finished by the end of the time of the three minutes are reached, I will ask uh, Ms. Garcia to talk to you vigorously. <laughs> we respectfully ask you not to repeat specific points made by prior speakers, a simple statement of uh, agreement with a prior testimony, acceptable and appreciated. Uh, we do not have anyone who has signed up prior to the meeting, so the floor is now open for anybody in the audience to testify, and then I will come back to the directors right after that. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to offer testimony on the plan that's being presented tonight? Okay. Hearing none, Mr. Teeter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commerce City thanks CDOT for continuing to advance the interchanges along US 85 and both the 120th Avenue, uh, 104th Avenue. The interchange at US 85 and 120th Avenue continues to be one of the top transportation priorities for the city. Since the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, evaluation to determine a preferred alternative for each of these intersections along US 85 between I-76 and 124th Avenue is still ongoing and no financial determination has yet been made at any of the intersections and the city does not want to preclude a possible interchange at the intersection of US 85 and 112th. Please note we are not asking to amend the amendment, just going on record that another interchange might be an outcome of a NEPA evaluation. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Teeter, thank you. Any other member of the, of the Board of Directors who has any testimony they'd like to offer at this time? Okay. If there are any other questions or none, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. The Board is currently scheduled to take action on the revised Metro Vision and the revised 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and Associated Air Quality Conformity Documents at its April 18th meeting. So thank you very much for your time and patience with the hearing for tonight. Next item, as we indicated, we will be moving item number 12. This is a presentation on the CDOT Smart Mobility Plan. Mr. Rex, you'd like to lead us in. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. We're very pleased tonight to have, well, full contingent of CDOT staff here this evening um, to talk about their smart, their smart mobility planning. Um, and as you all know, this work is extremely important to this region and, and obviously to this country as well because it has an impact on all of our communities. And um, we just want you to know that this, this work is, of course, not being done in a vacuum. Um, you know, this work is in close conjunction with the uh, with the work that we're currently doing as part of the mobility choice uh, blueprint. 
as well as some of the incredible work that the City of Denver, City County of Denver is doing on their, their Smart Cities initiative. And we really do appreciate CDOT's willingness to come here this evening and talk to us about, about what they're planning on doing and the collaborative opportunities that we have as staff, staff at Dr. Cog, as well as staff in your communities in participating with that. So without further ado, I will go ahead and um, I think, Mike, you're going to kick it off. I'm going to introduce uh, Mike Lewis, the CDOT director. Yeah, you're welcome to come up here. And, um, and then Amy Ford is going to, is next, and I think then, then Wes Maurer. It looks like it's a half hard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doug. Um, and thank you to all of you. Um, I, I'm going to be very brief because these are the ones that actually know what they're talking about. But I do want to sort of um, introduce the, the topic. All of us in this room and around the state work so hard together on physical infrastructure projects that are so important to our, to our communities, to our um, counties, to the state as a whole, and then how the state ties into the rest of the national transportation program. And, and you know, all of you work long hours um, to make that the best for our communities, and we work together on that. And I think it's a very successful partnership for the most part, Mayor. Um, and, um, but I think, but I think that, um, we, we, and we need to continue to do that, but we also have to recognize that the times they are changing. And if we don't look to the future, look to the role that technology is gonna play in moving people and goods, um, as we all age, that is going to become more and more of a, of a requirement. Um, and, but the opportunity is there for us. And so a couple of years ago, under Shell and Bat, we, we got together and created this Road X program, virtually out of thin air. Um, but the idea was, how do we bring focus on technology um, into, into our industry? Um, and I think that what we're doing now, <clears throat> and we've, we, we wanted to institutionalize that at CDOT, and we created this past fall a new position called the Director of Advanced Mobility. So we're putting our Transportation System Management Operation um, Unit and our RoadX program under a program called Advanced Mobility. And we want to, we think that's a value here in Colorado and elsewhere around the country because it's going to, you know, we, we're very, very traditional in our roles of building, maintaining, to some degree, um, operating transit. Um, probably we're, we need a lot of catch up there, but if we create this institution of advanced mobility in our lexicon and in our organizational structures, I think that is going to enable us to accelerate the deployment of new technologies in solving our transportation challenges. But I think it's equally important, this is the perfect forum to have this discussion, um, is that there is no there can be no jurisdictional boundary on mobility. We all have our own um, responsibilities in our specific areas, but mobility happens between geographical boundaries, whether they're state boundaries, national boundaries, city boundaries, county boundaries. And so the more that we can work together on identifying those opportunities um, and, I, and, and, and uh, you know, there are a lot of leaders in this room that believe in that. And the more that we can work together, um, then I think we really will have done something for the people of Colorado because that mobility will be, will be borderless. There will be, you know, transitions where they need to take place and we'll break down those barriers that is preventing intelligent transportation. So with that, that's the, that's the impetus behind this. And um, we, you know, CDOT can't do it alone. CDOT shouldn't do it alone because we're only a, a small part of the overall transportation network. Um, it's local communities, it's counties, and it's our neighbors. Um, so that's, the, that's my sort of big picture message. And I welcome um, the opportunity to, to, to talk about this with you today and take your questions. But now I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, our new director of advanced mobility, um, and she and her staff, and Wes and others, I think there's a long line of us outside the door. Um, we'll uh, we'll make pr make the presentation and, and then look forward to taking questions and comments from you. So with that, Amy Ford. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> Who's this? 
Hmm, he looks familiar. Uh, you know, we wanted to take just a very quick opportunity again to talk a little bit about what advanced mobility was. And is, as we mentioned, it is the harnessing of technology to really advance these further goals of mobility and safety and how we move. Um, we have a unique opportunity, though, and, and that's really what we wanted to prime a little bit tonight is the opportunity, as, as, as Mike was mentioning, not just to think about jurisdictional boundaries, but how now we start looking even at the metro region. And, and this is where we have been sitting and talking a little bit with Doug and his staff and wanted to talk with you and frankly have been over the last year plus talking with you all about the idea of what a smart mobility region could really look like. That is the genesis of what is going to move forward, obviously, with mobility choice. We are going to mention a little bit more about what we are doing with a smart mobility plan, which helps set the framework across the entire state about how we leverage technology to sort of advance these, these uh, priorities. But let's talk just briefly about what a smart region and smart mobility could look like. What it looks like is not only are we working together and how we harness these technologies, but how do we create that seamless system and how do we start talking about interoperability? You know, we have a unique opportunity in time right now, and uh, it's one, frankly, that we haven't had in a long time, to start looking at where these technologies can take us and how we start thinking about how we all play together in looking at, at that. So whether it is signals and how we start thinking about the changes that are happening in signals and the technology and the capacity for them to be communicating not just with each other but with the vehicles that are out on the road. How do we start thinking about creating priorities for our transit systems and others, not just as they are looking at that city or that town but how they cross those jurisdictional boundaries. As we know, RTD is not just confined to one area, it is confined to an entire region. Um, how do we start thinking about interoperability when it comes to our data and our data sharing? Each of our jurisdictions and each of our towns, as well as the state, have data that helps advantage what we want to be able to do when it comes to mobility. So how do we truly start thinking about the data sharing environments that allow for us to take advantage of that, start optimizing the system and how we move those customers? How do we start thinking about perhaps even looking at sharing in our data platforms? And again, I think we and you are all starting to make investments as we start recognizing that things are starting to change dramatically whether it's cars that talk to each other and share data, whether it's cars that are self-driving, whether we start thinking about how we uh, help our pedestrians and our, our uh, bicyclists as they are on our roadway systems, communicating with each other, communicating perhaps even with autonomous cars so we avoid tragedies, for instance, that maybe happened uh, just the other day in Tempe, Arizona. So how do we start taking advantage of that as a collective region? How do we do that across the state? And so the last piece of that, of course, is shared mobility and interoperability really when it comes to that customer experience. How do we think about mobility as a service collectively? Cities do that well. The state has never really looked at that. And that is something also that we are starting to talk about. What does it mean to truly have mobility as a service that we, even as a state DOT, partake in and work with you about? So that's the tee up one more time uh, as we start talking about our smart mobility plan because all of these not only drive that experience, but they also drive what our investments are and how it fits into broader things like a Metro Vision plan. And so I'm going to let Wes take it from here and talk to you about the actual plan that we're going to do with all of our, uh, with uh, you and with rest, rest of the state. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Mike and Amy are a tough act to follow. I've been with the DOT for eight months now, uh, and it's, it's really that vision that they laid out that uh, drew me um, to work at CDOT and you know, really uh, realized throughout eight months that it, it really isn't smoke and mirrors. It is innovation. It is something that I think is, is leading not only in Colorado but uh, in other places too. And, um, Really an honor to talk to you all about it too, in terms of what the nexus is uh, with CDOT and and Dr. Cog. So um, I'll have three asks for you tonight. One is just your acknowledgement and awareness of our planning efforts and how they relate to partnerships with you all. Uh, two is uh, encouragement of Dr. Cog's staff to work with us in partnership and really share a, a vision for technology. Uh, and transportation moving forward, and, and three, the potential to 
update you all um, in six to 12 months on, on really where we're going with smart mobility planning, uh, where we're at with technology and, and council and, and from, from you all in terms of um, where we're headed in the future. So um, with that said, uh, smart mobility planning. Um, I, I've had the great honor to be involved with uh, Mobility Choice Blueprint and, and kind of all of the things that are wrapped up in there, all of the, the agencies that are working together to share that collective vision uh, moving forward and, and really thinking about what is smart mobility um, planning for CDOT. It's really emulating on a statewide level the, the essence of what Dr. Cog is, which is weaving together that fabric of, of local initiatives, of innovation, uh, of not stopping at, at political boundaries, but really working to make everything uh, work in tandem. And if you think of uh, you know, how we built up Colorado in the 20th century with concrete and asphalt and continue to do that, uh, 21st century mobility and, tr and transportation has that digital layer in there. And, uh, just like we wouldn't build a road that doesn't connect to, to, the, to its surroundings, it's the same thing with our technology systems, as, as Amy mentioned, uh, within, within her vision and that vision for a, a truly smart region and a smart state. So um, with that said, smart mobility planning is kind of a journey that it's the first of its kind at CDOT. It's something that um, we're, we're just hitting the road with uh, this year and, and aiming to be finalized. Um, in 2018, so that that plan uh, for us within within the, the DOT um, is intended to create a five to ten year vision and plan for maximizing the benefits of uh, new technologies in the transportation sector. And, and with that, uh, not not getting caught up in the smoke and mirrors and and, and flashy advertisements of new technology, but really uh, to the se second point, define the goals. Uh, to improve safety and efficiency of Colorado's transportation system through the use of technology. What does that mean uh, in deployment? What does that mean in terms of uh, how we right size and, and optimize safety and efficiency of the network um, to set ourselves up as, as leaders uh, o over time? And then preparing the DOTs, the wide, wide array of things that go into transportation planning from the assets to data management, to communication systems, and, and infrastructure to maximize the benefits of a lot of different technologies, but, but also with connected and autonomous vehicles. If we think of the planning efforts that'll take place and the technologies that'll come out on the roadway in the next five or 10 years, uh, what specifically to connect and autonomous vehicles uh, mean to that? And how can we best leverage uh, the benefits of those within our, our planning process? So the plan has uh, has several different layers to it, and and I kind of like to think of it as, as kind of a, a multi-layered pyramid, where you know really the foundation of the base um, are regional technology plans that are based uh, in the CDOT transportation regions. There's five of them across the state, as you all know. But really having those plans take into account local initiatives, local uh, laboratories for innovation, such as what's what's going on uh, at Dr. Cog. Um, mobility choice, as I've mentioned, and other initiatives, and rolling that all up so those, those are all working in tandem with, with the department's approach uh, to how we deploy that technology to build really a foundation of unified support and planning uh, for innovative local and regional technology projects. Um, that's our base and that's our intention uh, of initially when we go out and uh, jumpstart this process, that's where we want to be at, at, at the heart of it. Um, the, the ultimate phase of this plan will be rolling those up uh, after partnering with you all uh, in the region to create a five to ten year summary plan for statewide technology deployment along with the technology toolbox that we track uh, different emerging pilot and, and uh, mainstream technologies moving forward. Um, that plan is meant to be a link to other transportation planning efforts so that we're all uh, on the same page in harmonizing investments and efforts and, and, and uh, trains of thought uh, moving forward in those kind of more broad spanning partnerships uh, and, and with the anticipation that you know budgetary and institutional support uh, would be a critical part of that. You obviously continued support from the state and federal levels uh, for what's going on locally but uh, you know, really line items for technology projects, baking that into the cake in terms of how we, we view our transportation systems and our, 
our urban systems developing moving forward and other cost shares were appropriate. So really the ultimate goal or you know the top tier of of what we're getting at is, is a smart technology future for Colorado. So just having uh, for as our guiding light um, from from the bottom up a transparent and articulate uh, and integrated approach to the cutting edge technology for deployment uh, in Colorado. Uh, within that plan, we, we want to kind of create a pipeline uh, to mainstream new technologies to make sure that we're responsibly uh, and safely leveraging new technology and, and tracking kind of in three buckets. Um, conceptual technologies, if you think of where uh, self-driving vehicles were five years ago, somebody would, would have said, you know, talk to my children or my grandchildren about it, but really, you know, they're, they're on the road, uh, whether we're planning for them or not uh, right now. And so really leveraging um, the conceptual kind of thought process of longer term planning. Uh, and then using um, through uh, what we intend to call a smart mobility committee, um, local actors, people who are managing uh, technology projects that may be first of their kind in Colorado, to come back to a committee and say, I'm doing this, I've, uh, you know, we've agreed on these performance metrics and these are the results of a pilot so that we can start that, again, that, that pipeline to take a conceptual technology try it out in a safe environment in Colorado and then and then mainstream it where we can by, by leveraging local expertise and, and, and local pilots uh, in that sense. So at a high level that's that's what we're considering uh, smart mobility planning uh, this year. Um, three different phases. Phase one um, we're really getting our consultant queued up right now to, to help us to uh, engage with you all in our transportation regions. That's phase one. That'll be uh, now until roughly May uh, of this year and, and what happens in that phase is, is us going out to you all and, and to my earlier point about acknowledgement and, and staff engagement on the Dr. Cog side, uh, really helping us to create that vision, that collective vision uh, that, that drives us forward together uh, and then jumping into phase two um, which is this summer um, doing the regional planning, going out into the regions, uh, collecting that feedback um, identifying that criteria and baking that up into regional plans. Uh, the last step before we even think about making that statewide plan is those regional plans and then phase three uh, moving into this fall and winter um, developing a statewide plan that encompasses uh, all of the local localized initiatives into into one um, kind of unified approach uh, in terms of how we see it with the department. So with that said, uh, again, three, three requests, just your acknowledgement um, and, and hopefully support of the planning efforts that uh, we're getting underway uh, in 2018. Uh, two, encouraging your staff to, to interact with us and work with us to, to form that collective vision. And three, uh, I'd love to come back uh, in six to 12 months or whenever is appropriate and update the board on, on where we're at. So that, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I would like to open up for discussion. Okay, thanks, Ms. Mike, thanks to all coming down tonight. Amy, it is good to see you here not announcing some kind of catastrophe on the state highways. At least you're here in a positive role tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Don't jinx it, Mike. Uh, any questions for our uh, guest here from CDOT, Mr. Brockett? Thanks for that presentation. I'm really glad that we're keeping our eye towards the future and doing this, these great planning initiatives. But I'm curious, that right now, so far, it's kind of short on specifics. And I'm curious um, what you see as specific technologies or projects that might be implementable in that kind of five-year time frame. Like, what are the first things that we're going to be seeing coming out of this? I know you still have planning to do, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think will be some early initiatives. That's a great question. Um, specific projects that we could take on in the next five years. Interoperable data and data sharing. Uh, so specifically, as you guys are aware, we are embarking in a rather extensive effort right now about how we create a connected data ecosystem. And that is really to prepare for this future where cars are sharing data back and forth with each other and sharing data back and forth with the infrastructure, such that it informs the vehicles, either the driver, the human driver, eventually the autonomous system, how and what to do to preserve safety, to improve mobility and the like. I think we have an incredible opportunity to sit and look at how we can share in that platform and share data. So take, for instance, the I-25 fire that happened with our truck. And uh, 
think about what happened. Where's my Greenwood Village folks? There you are. Mm -hmm. To Greenwood Village streets when we shut down I-25. And the data sharing that A, where vehicles were going, B, how we could direct those vehicles and where they should be going, and then C, how we can even tie that data and into cohesive regional systems such as our signal systems. You actually had PD out at some of those lights flagging people through because the way the stacks of the traffic had gotten were so severe that we couldn't manage that system and it closed your system down as well. So that's an example of interoperable data exchange, both on the data sharing side, and this is something that actually we are looking at already doing outside of the connected vehicle environment that West's team is working on. So data exchange and shared data platforms with the potential then actually of starting to look at interoperability on signalization. And those are very specific goals. I'm not suggesting that we're going to all come to a common agreement on exactly what kind of signals we should all put into the region together. But I think we have an incredibly interesting opportunity right very now to actually look at some of that potential. And then that becomes a shared operations platform for all of us so that, for instance, something like I-25 maybe doesn't happen again. I got you. Let me see. Mr. Brock, did that answer your question? That was helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rakowski. Thank you, Ms. Ford, for the opportunity to recognize the city and county of Denver and the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office which each had the other end of this issue, mm -hmm. and they were instrumental in having, having things happen. Now, we have made great strides with interoperability of signal systems with Centennial. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do more with Denver, and Chrissy, that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Flynn, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, Amy or Wes, how, how do you envision maybe in the short term at least, how does the network function when there are a lot of vehicles still on the road that don't participate, that don't share data, the, you know, some old pickup trucks or vintage cars, things like that. Does that mess up the system? I'm, th I'm in mind of what happened in Arizona mm -hmm. with the pedestrian fatality. That, 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 how does that set us back at all? Yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent question. And um, right now what you're going to see, I think, in the next five years is auto manufacturers starting to put this technology, and they already are, into their new vehicles. So when you start looking at a fleet turnover, we actually are looking statewide at prediction in the next five to ten years that we would have four million vehicles on the road in Colorado that have that capacity to be connected. Out of, oh, that actually I don't know. I think it's about... It's, it's right higher, it's a little bit higher than our population, so it's right around six-ish, seven-ish usually. Um, that's one of the parts that we're working on pretty extensively. But the other piece to tie into this is also the capacity of how you work with fleet. And so the con idea behind connected vehicles is that you have enough market penetration that it starts creating the effectiveness and the optimization of the system when you're looking at the sharing of the data. So, you know, in, in conversations where you talk with the city and county of Denver about combining in how we put this technology into the fleet with RTD, with our fleet and with others. And that actually can be even aftermarket uh, penetration with some of these vehicles that are uh, older. So there's a lot of work yet to be done. I think what does not exist, and this is where Colorado is actually leading, and we have an opportunity as an entire state and as regions to build, if you will, the internet of vehicles. And um, that is what we are doing. We're looking at building a commercial grade internet of vehicles that has the capacity of sharing, just to give you a sense of this. When we have that basic market penetration, one lane of traffic on I-70 in the mountains for one area, uh, hour, will produce approximately 2 billion data points. That's an incredible amount of data that goes in short bursts in between all these vehicles into the infrastructure. So 2 billion data points. What doesn't exist is the ecosystem to be able to handle that, understand it, process it, do prescriptive data, then back out to the vehicles and take that back and forth. That's what we're choosing to invest in as a state. And the opportunity, I think, to collaborate with you all doesn't mean that you have to be within that platform of ours, but the ability for our stuff to share with yours, I think there's an incredible opportunity there. Ma'am, go ahead. Um, we're under huh? There we go. Um, we're currently undertaking uh, our transportation planning in the city of Littleton. <clears throat> And I would say we may not be as equipped or as in informed to begin to bring some of this um, thinking and information to our transportation plan. How do we work with you to do that? 
Yeah, so that's, you know, I feel like that mirrors a little bit of our approach uh, at the DOT. I mean, we were, it, you know, just listening to Amy talk, we're relatively advanced in terms of how we approach the technology. It's something that we, you know, look at every day. However, we don't claim to know everything. And that's, you know, kind of the beauty of smart mobility planning in our eyes is um, it's if it's just a DOT alone effort, uh, it's not going to be as successful as when we leverage all of the knowledge that we have on, on the localized levels and kind of look uh, across the jurisdictional boundary and look at what, what other people are doing. And so, um, again, we, we do intend, uh, with as rapidly as technology is changing right now, once you put a plan on paper, it's, it's static, right? And, and we want a committee that uh, keeps that fresh and is moving the ball forward with localized innovative projects. Right, um, that doesn't mean everybody do the same thing at the same time. That means uh, everybody has license to to have their own laboratory in their backyard and, and learn from the next town over and the next region over of what we're doing. So it is intended to, to leverage uh, that knowledge and, and be something that kind of sparks innovative innovation. Whether uh, you're living and eating and sleeping uh, on on that technology every single day, or whether uh, it's something of interest that you want to build up. Um, we want to make uh, smart mobility planning a, an avenue for them. Can I just jump in on that, Wes, too? And, and I, we are at the very nascent stages of this discussion. You know, and, and I think it's what we're trying to say is let's all get on the road together because we'll learn from one another. And we'll, we'll make some missteps collectively and take, have to go backwards. But if, if we by creating this director of advanced mobility, and, and we're hoping, again, to institutionalize it, make it the third leg of the stool, capital improvements, operations and maintenance, advanced mobility. And we, 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 we talk about that as we talk about what widening we're going to do on I-25, or what, um, what interchange improvement are we going to make, or what, um, what are we going to, what's the next RTD um, you know, line that's going to get incorporated, or how do we get from how do we make the connections between all of our independent systems in a more, in a more, um, uh, you know, collective way? But the, but I th what we're trying to do is, is start the conversation and get the conversation always on the agenda. And so we're really starting from scratch. So we don't have the answer, but let's start working on it together. Karina, let me let me say this. Um, we have staff members who've been working on this, you know, for some time, and I'm going to point to Deb and even her team, and we have a technology toolkit, some of the development pieces that we have done with that, the process that we'll be doing here with the Smart Mobility Plan, and we would also be happy to come in and share staff experience, sort of lessons learned, scenario planning that we have already done, and to share that over. These are things that also we are continuing to share within the Mobility Choice uh, program as well. But at an individual level, um, we would be happy to work with you guys on that too, and impart some of some of what we gathered at least over the last couple of years. Thank you, Mr. Deal, and then Ms. Jones. Yes, I, I, Mr. Chair, I just returned from the National League of Cities conference and went to the Smart Cities uh, session, and I was interested in what could be done more in the, uh, almost in the short term. And here are five things they mentioned that. I think are doable in maybe the next two years or whatever. Uh, Microtransit with apps, uh, fare collection, autonomous shuttles, but also golf cart type vehicles because even FedEx came to Golden and asked for permission to use, uh, or it was, could have been UPS, to use golf carts over the Christmas time. They never did, but they thought about it. Also, uh, smart computer van pooling, whereas the van pool keep going by and they'd know you're there like Uber does. And lastly, something that I think is really darn important is non-emergency medical transport. So even enterprise, if you notice on their ads anymore, they're not talking just about um, rental cars. They're talking about renting almost a lot of things. And so I think those are five examples of things that we could the cities could work with you and try to see how we can be a smart city and maybe be 
uh, adopters 1.5. <laughs> I, I, we agree. Obviously, as you guys may have seen, Uber and Lyft recently have started actually health care services uh, that transport people to and from appointments and the like. Um, you know, part of the smart mobili uh, the mobility choice program, and I know you guys have heard presentations, but it's not only infrastructure investment, but one of the big pieces is the tools for the customers. So a very customer-centric focus on what we're looking at with mobility choice, and I think you just framed out a lot of those with a customer hat on, and so I think there's great opportunity, and we've been working with some of those partners. I know the city and county of Denver has, and I think again as a region about how we collectively leverage that through Dr. Cog, I think there's, there's some opportunity, and how do we move with haste? Uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to take real low-hanging fruit and to start some of these programs collectively. And that's, again, what Wes mentioned is our, our, our desire to sort of start some of that discussion, even as we continue with the planning side. Ms. Jones. Thanks so much for being here tonight. It's great to hear your presentation. And this is, I guess, a good segue with um, Director Dale's comments. Um, all of these technologies, if implemented properly, could have so many benefits land use, safety, air quality, um, but without certain sidebars might not, uh, might increase VMT, might clog streets more. Um, and so I'm curious whether or not in your plan you're going to include any policy recommendations about how best to guide the technologies and the infrastructures in a way to maximize benefit. Uh, because it's, it's policy, it, without any policy framework, we, we could end up in, in a much worse place rather than a much better place. I, I think you're right. And uh, yes, we do intend to sort of build on that. We've recently completed a policy working group that some of you were participants in that is leading into our smart mobility planning process. Much of what comes from the smart mobility plan is helping us drive also our investment strategies. Where do we go with fiber? Where do we start thinking about actual hard level investments to enable this future? But I think actually Deb and Chrissy uh, mentioned this at our last mobility choice session, which was I think really appropriate to your comment, is what is the future that we want? Is our goal to actually decrease VMT even though we know we may have autonomous vehicles running around? So how is it that we think about the encouraging of shared ridership and the like? <laughs> Um, how do we establish those so that that helps us drive the implementation of the technology as well? And I think that that's going to be a starting point for us as well. And that's why I mentioned mobility as a service early on in our thought process too. It is not just about the whiz-bang cool of the technology. This is about the goals that we're striving for as, as an entire state. And I think that that's a core tenant of what the mobility choice piece is going to be too. And, it, you know, I want to say this probably just again, but recognizing that these processes at the state level and what mobility choices are going in parallel they are sinking quite a bit, and we want to make sure that they, they reflect each other throughout this entire process so that it's copacetic with what those goals are as well coming off of mobility choice. Ms. Walton. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for being here. There you are. <laughs> Where about you? The be? voice. Um, I have two um, thoughts that I wanted to share and whether you're prepared to comment, thank you. Um, one thing that um, occurs to me as a parent who is embarking on driver's education starting on Saturday, um, public safety is a whole other layer of consciousness My for our family. My daughter got her permit, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I also um, have been involved in some recent conversations around hazard planning and emergency management circles. And so, um, it dawns on me that with such an internet reliable or relying on an internet built system and the threat that many emergency managers are talking about in terms of cyber attacks, um, our transportation we know nothing is about cyber attacks. <laughs> our transportation <laughs> it puts our transportation at, at a very significant um, susceptible to that kind of thing. And so I was wondering if you are able to um, give any updates on um, the cyber attack that CDOT is dealing with now. Perhaps that puts you ahead of the game of some forward thinking, but um, I'm wondering, you know, how those kinds of advanced planning and perhaps some people at the table that you wouldn't necessarily always have in a, in a different type of uh, conversation. The other thing I wanted to comment on is with some pretty exciting technology that you might be talking about um, and, uh, and that we may be talking about, it, you know, there are always the early adopters. And I think that 
it's important to think about who an early adopter is versus um, things um, as it pertains to vulnerable populations um, and our um, and our aging population mm -hmm. that need to be considered because um, an early adopter and my mom just don't come to mind necessarily <laughs> so <laughs> how am I going to convince her no this is okay to go to your doctor's appointment just yeah. get in yeah. <laughs> go <laughs> yeah. um, Th those are those are very very real issues that we are all going to have that the industry is going to have to deal with. It's been you know that the whole s the security um, there are two two primary issues. One is um, that were er raised very early on. One was um, protection of personal privacy, that you know that, and then the security of a system. If somebody can hack into the system, how do we ensure that that's that we're protected? So the, there's been for about the better part of a decade, more than a decade a group of um, original equipment manufacturers, the, the auto industry, the U.S. Department of Transportation, the states, and others getting together to talk through what are the protocols that we need to have in place to protect that. So there's been a, there's more than a decade of planning that, um, and, the, and the, the OEMs have gone a long way in addressing that because their, their future depends on that. I mean, Uber was definitely set back this week because of the incident in Arizona, um, I think you know we'll learn more about what, how that happened, and the and the industry will learn from that to to improve it. But the, the you know when we it was last weekend that we heard the um, there was a concern raised about our our uh, energy transmission network and international hacking. Um, so that it, it is it, we live in that world. Um, we experienced that over the last four weeks at CDOT. Um, and it was very disruptive. Um, I'll, I'll say we're, we're, we're virtually back to normal, um, not quite, um, but over the next couple of weeks we, we, we will be, but it's very disruptive. And that, that only attacked our, our sort of operating business um, network, not our t transportation systems. Um, we were very concerned about that, but the firewalls protected that. So it's, it's learning how do we protect our systems um, we had some very interesting folks in the office um, uh, that I wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley um, that uh, had all sorts of letters behind their names because it's a big deal. And they, um, they came in and found the source of the, of the hack and we'll never hear again what they do with that. But it's, it, was, it, was, um, it was a wake up call for all of us. And so I can't, but, but the, the fear of that vulnerability is not a reason not to continue to move forward. I think it's that's that's a very critical issue that we need to address before we get implementation, before it becomes mainstream. It's how do we ensure that those protections are in place to the level of of uh, comfort that we'd need. There's no there's no such thing as a zero risk proposition um, in anything that we do. But how do we find how do we determine that acceptable level of risk? On the second, the early adopter. Um, I'm sure, you know, and, and, and I think we've all read or heard anecdotes about um, horseless carriages, right? Because they were, you know, the devil's creation. And then within a very few short years, horses disappeared and the whole buggy whip industry disappeared. So there's a, there is a, I'm not going to say that this is going to have that same rate of adoption, um, but but there will be early... We have to find those early adopters, learn from them what what worked for you, what didn't work for you, and then I think it will spread. So, you know, the, the, I think the the connections, safety on the highway, I think, is one of the things that we see as the perhaps the greatest advantage that comes out of these technologies. But I also think, and I don't know if if Chrissy or Elise could comment on this, but Making, a tra making our transit systems more accessible to many more people that will really get, enable the, to us to get the, the true benefit that our, that our fixed transit systems and others um, to get that first and last mile. I think that's a huge opportunity that we have in front of us. And that may be the, the early benefit of these connected technologies um, because there is no longer, you know, there's no that, the hesitancy to use a transit system is like, is what's that inconvenience to get from home to the transit, from the transit to work. 
maybe that can go away. And, and I think those are, those are some of the early adoptions I think are possible. Ms. Fanganello, if you would, please. Thank you. There's um, so many things I could say. But one, I, I can't let the challenge go un unnoticed, so Director Ruskowski, I, I accept the challenge, absolutely. But at the same time, I would, uh, I would challenge everyone in the room, quite frankly, because it's going to take all of us working together to do a better job. Um, I do think that it's important for us to think about what's the community, uh, the city you know, that we want to build, whether it's Denver or the, the region as a whole, what's that outcome that we're searching for, and recognizing in the, the transportation investments that we make, whether they're you know, technology related or otherwise, that it, it's through that process that, that that's, those are means to an end. The end is your outcome of this, the community that we're all here to build every single day, and technology is a component of that. And there is a lot happening in this space, so you know, I talk to CDOT colleagues weekly um, on opportunities for us to partner together. We were talking earlier today about, about what we can do to get to better together. There's just so much for us to do on the signal side alone, the safety side. Um, if we really want to jump in and, and work together. So it, it's a little bit scary, but I do think there's such big opportunities for us as a region um, to really move forward ahead and quickly if we're, if we're brave enough to do so. Um, so that's my challenge back out to everybody else is let's, let's actually work together and make this happen um, and acknowledge how do we work together both at that local, regional, and that statewide level to make it work. Um, and the people are doing it. Uh, the city of Detroit will be uh, implementing a pilot this year with an autonomous vehicle, a shuttle. So not, not a single individual, but not like a 30 seat individual bus or something, but you know, somewhere in the middle. They will deploy it this year. So it is possible if we want to work together and, and be a little bit brave. Mr. Vidum. So uh, in the game of golf, every single year, uh, there are uh, brilliant new engineered clubs and uh, brilliant new engineered uh, golf balls. But the people that buy those products, their score almost never goes down. Okay, so um, as, as these uh, very well-designed, clever technologies move out of the R&D phase and into actual uh, usage in the state of Colorado, Will the people that are uh, going to and from work or going to and from shopping experiences, will they actually experience any difference? And if so, wh what is the difference going to be? I, you, go ahead. You still use a persimmon wood, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I still have my wood tennis racket, so, you know. Um, you know, that's an excellent question. And um, as you guys know, Rodex is a very tip of the spear kind of program. It is designed to bring first of its kind or first in Colorado technologies here to look at it, to test it, and going back to the pipeline that, um, that uh, Wes was talking about, see how it works. We don't want to invest in Betamax when we are tracking towards VHS and we're very really thoughtful about that process, but recognize that that could happen in the course of, of this level. And how we work together and where each of the sort of smart mobility labs are, you know, Aspen is looking at a smart mobility lab, you know, Chrissy and, and Denver is looking at stuff, but this is where our working together I think is a key piece of that. Will, will the uh, drivers and others see the difference of these technologies on the road? That's our intent, because if they don't see the uh, difference of those technologies on the road, we will no longer continue to invest in them. Our first one coming up, as you guys, many of you know, is our Smart 25 project. As you know, we are rebidding that next week since it came in a little over our original bid uh, estimates. Um, but the goal of that is to make super, super smart, you know, ramp metering systems that have the capacity of improving the flow on I-25. The only way that works, too, is with heavy coordination with our local jurisdictions to make sure that our arterial systems and the mainline systems are all feeding and working well together. We are looking at the benefits of that to see that if we have the capacity to improve the traffic flow and our goals are up to 10 to 20 percent. That's what we're looking to see what this technology will do. It, on the other hand, is a bit of a proven one coming in from Australia. There are others that are the very first of its kind and we start thinking about that. How do we start talking about Hyperloop? or Hyperloop-like technologies. So there are some that are very here, and there are some that are proven that we are starting to move into the pipeline. So I can't say that they will all notice the immediate difference, but I pulled out my smartphone. Either we do it incrementally, or sometimes we take a leap. And if you guys remember in 2007, Steve Jobs sat up in front of everyone and held this up and said, this is going to change your life. 
and it did. So we, as part, and working with you guys, yeah, you know, some are not. Uh, uh, but I think that that's where our RoadX program and what we're doing with our Artismo programs, how we start to look at these technologies and willing for CDOT to say that we're willing to be out in front of this, we're willing to be a, a leader, we're willing to make investments in looking at this and actually take on some of that risk also on behalf of the entire state. I don't have anyone else in the queue at this point. Let me ask uh, Mike if you would. You know, last year in the, in the legislature, we opened up the possibility of autonomous cars, very limited. The problem is we've not done that to the federal level. And as slow and as prosperous as our federal government is, and forethought going on, by the time you and I are sprouting daisies, they might start to think about autonomous cars. Without that legislation, both at the federal and the state level, the potential for impact to these programs you're looking at Mm -hmm. is enormous. Excellent question, excellent point. This was this was discussed again. I was started to get involved in this arena probably you know better part of 15 years ago. And the feds the feds um NHTSA, Federal Highway, USDOT um were at the table. And and I think it became very clear to the auto manufacturers that if they were going to wait for federal leadership or guidance, and this is not a knock, it's just this is the reality. It, they move the higher up you go in the organization, the slower things, the longer things take. So the auto manufacturers and the technology industries, the Ubers and others, decided we need to move forward this, keep them at the table, we need to move forward. And the states, and I feel very strongly about this, Shalen felt very strongly about this, and a few others, Michigan, Utah, California, others felt. We need to drive, we at the states need to drive the, um, the early implementation. And the, if we can get critical mass at, a state, at the state level, um, then I think the feds are more likely to come on board and say, you know, we're going to make some of the mistakes early on, and, but then I think we're going to drive it. And, and I say at the state level, but it's also at the municipal level what's happening at the municipal level. And the more that we're working together in our own jurisdictions um, and then with, our, with other states, having, having collaboration, and we are with um, other states, um, then I think it's going to become a critical mass. And that's what's going to drive at the federal level because, because they're not going to be able to, to stay in the background. Well, we, we appreciate, uh, we've got one more in just a second. We appreciate the fact you came tonight and Amy, for you and Wes, uh, it's a great undertaking, and I would encourage you, as you've heard from some of them, reach out to your locals. Uh, please work with our transportation folks, as you're uh, doing already. But I think the opportunity is absolutely there for some great improvements for us as a state, and not just uh, here in the region, but uh, as we look forward. As we get some of these transportation bills before our voters and stuff, we get some improvement there. That also adds to the opportunity for CDOT to get the technology added into it as well. Great. Great. And, I, and I want to congratulate you all on your selection of your new transportation director. Um, I love it to refer to him as the traitor, but <laughs> our... <laughs> I think we're blaming Doug for a theft. Our loss is your game. <laughs> Ms. Baca, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And I concur with what the chair wrapped up in, in the support of uh, Dr. Cog and CDOT. So my question is, it's been a while since this board has looked at mobility choice blueprint, since we've heard from them, and we're already partners. So CDOT and Dr. Cog, we're already partners on that. So my question is, is um, what support are you seeking from the board tonight that maybe falls out of side of the parameters of mobility choice blueprint? So. Are we, compl are we complementing each other or, or are we duplicating efforts? Uh, we strongly believe that we're complementing each other, especially when it comes to the mobility choice and the smart mobility planning. The secondary piece to this that we would like your acknowledgement and support of is for us to start moving forward and looking at where the opportunities lie for interoperability and maybe even some quick win uh, identification of some projects that we could move together on. 
And that's really what we're looking forward to. Uh, what we were hoping is with Doug and his team is to be able to start looking at, and Chrissy, I think your challenge back out on the signals. I think we've all circled around that as an opportunity. The second side of that really is on the data sharing environment, uh, and that's something that Wes is already in the process of working with multiple members of Dr. Cog, but truly, honestly, buckling down and stopping making it words now and starting to make it real, and that's what we're looking to do. If I could add to that, Amy, I think we view, you know, we're mobility choice is that pushes it forward, but then we as institutions, whether we like it or not, are going to have to carry it forward. So I think we're looking at the mobility choice blueprint to inform our work collectively so that we as governmental entities can then go and carry it forth and actually actually implement recommendations. So that's how that's that complementary piece, I think. Thank you, Mr. Rex. No, I, I agree with all those comments, and I appreciate the question. Um, you know, and I, I think it's right. It's about us getting off the of center, right, on some things. We're looking for that low-hanging fruit, and I do appreciate both Amy and Wes reaching out to us on this interoperability conversation because it's a logical place for Dr. Cog to play. We already play in that space, right? We have a uh, regional traffic operations committee working group, which is basically traffic engineers w of, within your communities. That we, you know, we talk about those inner, inner, those that coordination of our of our regional facilities and all that, and um, so yeah. So we're, you know, I think if nothing else, we'd like to get, you know, a head nod from you all that that is an area you would you would desire for Dr. Cog staff to explore with your with your staffs, and hopefully we can arrive at a technology ultimately that can speak to each other because it just makes sense. Okay. Any last uh, comments? Then with the board's approval, I'm going to recommend that we ask our staff, as Mr. Rex has indicated, to move forward with the coordination between us and CDOT. And Mr. Fraser, we'd look to see you back here in, say, maybe six months instead of 12 months. Or maybe sooner, if you've got something hot to talk. We're always here every month. Thank you, guys. Mike, thank you, guys. Appreciate it, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to the reports of the chair, uh, the chair of the Performance Engagement Committee, Mr. Dyack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we did meet uh, March 7th. Uh, we, what we did is we elected a vice chair, uh, Director Beacom um, was, uh, uh, was elected to, to be vice chair again, uh, more than gracious to, to do so. We talked about the John V. Christensen Award, and we did make a selection. However, we cannot disclose any of that <laughs> until the night of. Uh, Distinguished Service Award recipients, we uh, talked about that. Uh, we talked about the uh, board workshop, uh, some breakout sessions, as well as the comments we got from last year to hopefully make uh, this year a um, better board workshop. And uh, Jerry Stiegel presented us with an employee survey and um, again, just uh, it's great to have some uh, some feedback from uh, from staff, and it looked all fantastic. So, Good. finance and budget committee, Ms. Stolzman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We authorize the executive director, Doug Rex, to negotiate and execute contracts that ultimately will help seniors in our region with transportation needs, and it will help with their health outcomes. So that's great news. We also had a presentation from um, Area Agency on Aging Director Jayla Sanchez Warren on our audit for the Area Agency on Aging, and she talked to us about some corrective actions and things they're going to do to tighten that up a little bit, but it was very positive overall. Thank you. Next item on our action is to appoint a member and an alternate to represent Dr. Cog at the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Ms. Jones, I presume you're still willing to serve? Um, I am more than willing to continue serving if the board uh, would like me to do so. Um, it's, it's been an honor and a, an interesting ride, and um, I find that um, it's helpful to have some continuity of relationship and understanding of the statewide agenda. Okay. As an alternate, I have two individuals who have indicated they are interested in uh, serving. Uh, one of those is Mr. Partridge, and the other one is Mr. Dale. Yes, Mr. Dale. I'd like to remove my name from consideration for a stack and be reconsidered when we go to item 11 for the Regional Transportation Committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else from the floor who would like to uh, volunteer to either serve as a member or as an alternate for the stack? 
Seeing none, I have uh, one person who is uh, proposed as the stack representative, and that is Mr. Lee Jones and Mr. Roger Parchers as the alternate. Could I have a motion to accept that? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> All right, next item up is the E-470 rep and the alternate. I have uh, two names that have been submitted uh, so far. One is present, one is not. We like electing those who don't show up. First is the rep for the E-470 is Mr. Ron Murkowski. And the second, uh, do you have a back? Did we hear from him? Yeah, Bob Roth will be the alternate. To Mr. Bob Roth is proposed as the alternate. Are there any other names who would like to throw their hat as the E-470 rep or alternate? Seeing none, I would propose a motion for the acceptance of uh, the E-470 rep as Mayor Ron Rakowski and Councilman Bob Roth from the City of Aurora. Do I have a motion? So I have a motion and a second. I had a second, but I couldn't figure it. Okay. Thanks, Richard. All those in favor, please signify by aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Rex. Wow. Okay. It's thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you. So, um, annual award celebration. We're just over a month away, and, of course, this is hosted by the Dr. Cog Board, so this is truly your event. Um, it's April 25th down at the Hyatt. And um, the reception starts at 6, dinner shortly after, after that at 7 o'clock. Um, we have confirmed Governor Hickenlooper at, uh, to deliver the keynote. And uh, Amelia Earhart uh, will uh, MC the event again, as she has done for the past couple, couple three years. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, board directors attend free. Guests may attend at a reduced rate of uh, $49. Um, so use the coupons that are on, that are on the flyer that's included in, in your packet this evening or, or at your place. Um, so we really, you know, please, we really want to have a great crowd. Uh, we had over 400, 450 or something last year, and we hope to exceed that number this year. So, so please sign up, and if you have difficulty in signing up through our website, just please call myself or anyone on our communication staff, and they'll be happy to do it for you. Bike to Work Day, my word, I can't believe we're talking about this already, but uh, Bike to Work Day is uh, June 27th this year. Um, and Steve, Steve Erickson's Way to Go team is already planning our biggest and best event ever. They're expecting over 36,000 riders this year. Um, so I, we do have a little, the little flyer. This was the, um, the front of the flyer represents the winning poster. We do a, we do a call for submissions, and uh, this was chosen this year. It's pretty cool. I don't think I could have done it. So it's pretty cool. So we're excited about that. Um, we are having an open house um, in which we'll provide community and, and, and company organizers um, everything they need to succeed with that event, toolkits for business challenges, toolkits for station organizers, and promotional materials as well. So um, please mark that on your calendar. Get that Lycra out. Board short courses. Um, we have one on the 15th was uh, Metrovision 1, and we do have two others that are upcoming that are, already, that are scheduled in the the Aging Disability Resources on April 12th, and the Transportation and Mobility one is scheduled for May 17th. So please sign up. Just contact Connie, and she'll get you on the list. So um, I would like to just uh, um, to recognize one of our staff members. Um, earlier today, the Denver Business Journal held their 40 under 40 um, event, event. And for those who are not familiar with that, it recognizes 40 outstanding local professionals under the age of 40 for their business success and their community uh, contribution, contributions. Our very own Celeste Davis Strogan, stand up Celeste, what, uh, from our Way to Go team. She, she's our Way to Go program uh, and marketing manager, um, was honored at the luncheon today as a recipient. And uh, so we were obviously very proud of Celeste, uh, Celeste and all the works and all of her accomplishments here at Dr. Cog, and we're glad she's part of the team. So congratulations, Celeste. Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. Um, this is our third iteration, I believe, or fourth? I don't know where we flow here. One of the two. So we've, uh, we've come up with a date for that. It's Wednesday, May 30th in this room. And the topic this year is Regional Economics 101. How, the, how to run with the big dogs. I didn't come up with it, I just read it. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. So I, I know that uh, Flo's putting together a, 
a pretty great program right now, and uh, so we'll get more information out to you all here real soon. So Dr. Cog, we also had a day at the Capitol on March 9th. Um, it was a tremendous event. We, you know, we were referring to it as a legislative breakfast, and I got a call from somebody, found out about it, no one in this room, and they were wondering why they weren't invited. And I kind of chuckled myself when I was trying to explain it to this, to this person, because it was really us in the hallway with bagels, right? I mean, it wasn't, it, <laughs> if anybody's familiar with that, it's basically, it's right by the, the, um, the old Supreme Court chamber there in that hallway. But I'll tell you what, we, it, it was tremendous. We had 35 plus legislators that came by and, and were very much engaged in, in uh, you know, some of the displays and everything we had there. So we were very appreciative of them stopping by, including the speaker stopped stop by, so that was great. And I would like to thank very much um, Rich, Rich Morrow and, and, uh, for, for the work that he did in coordinating the event, as well as, um, as Brad Calvert and his team, as well as Steve Erickson and our communications staff in uh, making sure the event went smoothly and all the displays were what, where they were supposed to be and all that kind of good stuff. So it was very good. And they also entered, they, um, they recognized us on the floor as well. So that was kind of neat. Um, I have a Twitter account. Thank you. So please follow me. Right? It's, it's, Dr. Co it's at Dr. Cog Director. I have two followers in this room. <laughs> well, more. Two on the board. Thank you, Director Brockett, and thank you, D uh, Director Wynn. No, it's a tremendous follow. Just ask them. No, please. <laughs> That's exactly right. No, I would appreciate it. No, it's, it's kind of fun, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm starting to get into it. Um, so, but last but not least, I do want to introduce formally our new transportation planning and operations director. Um, they kind of stole my thunder a little bit earlier. Um, but I am excited, very excited to announce that after a na nationwide search, we have so selected Ron Papsdorf to serve as the new TPO director. So he's, he's the new me, right? And he's version 2.0. <laughs> Ron right there. So some of you might already know Ron. He's worked at CDOT for the last three years or so. Um, uh, he's served. Um, in his latest capacity over there is a deputy director of CDOS office, office, and, and policy, office of Policy and Government Relations. Um, he has 25 years of experience in transportation policy and planning, planning development, the majority of which has been spent in the Portland, Oregon area and uh, at, um, at the city of Gresham um, uh, as the transportation planning manager and then later the government relations director. He's also has served a stint with the city of Scottsdale, Arizona as a senior transportation planner. So. Welcome, Ron. There's no one as, as excited as me to have you on staff. Um, and uh, if, it, if, if you would allow, Mr. Chairman, I've asked Ron if he, if he wishes to uh, just say a few words just to introduce himself to you. Um, and I think he's going to take me up on that. So he is just like me. Never passes up an opportunity to talk. I won't. And, and Doug originally told me I'd have 20 minutes. <laughs> but out of respect did not. for the time tonight, I feel like I was filibustered a little bit my, by my former colleagues at CDOT. Um, Maybe intentionally, maybe not. Uh, I, I just want to say I'm really excited to be here and, and join the Dr. Talk, Dr. Cog team. Uh, it's a great group of folks. I really look forward. I, I, I enjoy seeing a lot of familiar faces here today and look forward to the chance to get to know those of you that I don't know as well. Um, really excited to work with you. I think you were all right, asking the right questions of the CDOT folks tonight about advanced mobility. And as we start to kick off this year, the update to the uh, MetroVision RTP, I think those are issues we're going to have to wrestle with as a group and uh, just look forward to working with all of you and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Ron, very much. Um, just by the way, Deb Perkins Smith has not said a word to me since that hire. <laughs> not returning phone calls, nothing, just saying. That's my report, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So should, do we go to the tagline, Trader Ron now? Or? <laughs> right. I think Mike, Mike left Ooh. his name tag here. I, I see a tweet. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated. Sorry, my bad. Sorry. We get him a helper and he starts taking over already. <laughs> so I'll try to start again. I'm sorry. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held. 
before this board. Considering the action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. So for the record, do we have anyone in the audience who would like to come forward for public comment? Okay, that's enough time. <laughs> Moving on to the consent agenda. Moving, uh, the consent agenda uh, contains the items of, uh, shown as attachment B, which are the minutes of the February 21st, 18. I would entertain a motion this time to accept the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? And on these, I will not ask if you want to abstain. I hope there's nothing for you to abstain over. Looking at the next item on the discussion of solicitation of interest to serve on the performance and engagement, uh, finance and budget, and the regional transportation committee. Ladies and gentlemen, as the voting members representing your organizations, we highly, with a lot of arm twisting, do request that you look seriously at at least the performance and engagement and finance and budget. Those are the two groups that make the decisions on what we do from a policy standpoint and bring them back to the board for final approval. The Regional Transportation Committee also is a part of the efforts that we do here working with our partners such as CDOT, RTD, and some of our local business groups. Opportunity to serve there as well. So if you are interested in serving on those areas, please contact staff at your earliest opportunity. Mr. Dale, we will take your notice that you're interested in the RTC. But ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to notify us as soon as possible if you have any ability or willingness or will be recruited to serve on either the performance engagement or the finance and budget. Uh, Chairman Stolzman and Chairman Dyack, you have free authority to go out and recruit any way you can, but you cannot both recruit the same person. So by recruit, do you mean just randomly selecting I just, and saying you're it, you're I it, you're think it? you just tag them if nothing else. Oh, okay. As soon as you figure out you don't have enough in your committee, we have a group of 58 to choose from. Wow. Uh, before I forget it, there was a change in our membership. Uh, we did pick up a new alternate for Jefferson County, Tina Francone. Some of you may remember Tina served on the RTD board and then foolishly jumped into politics in Jefferson County as a commissioner. I don't know why you commissioners don't do something about these things, but we lost her. She's now over with Jefferson County, which is partly mine. Also, from the town of Firestone, we have a, two new members. We have a new member, Drew Peterson, and uh, Miss Bobby Sindelar. Unfortunately, I don't think either one are here tonight. So when they are here, we will try to make sure they get properly introduced. But welcome to Firestone and to our new alternate from Jefferson County. So moving on, discussion of state legislative issues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morrow. Chair. Uh, good after or good evening, directors. Um, I think it, this takes us to attachment D and attachment E in your packets. I'm not sure what the page numbers are. Um, have a, a couple of. Uh, actually, we only have a, a fairly short list of new bills, but we do have an important update on the status of bills, which I think is the first uh, item there um, of bills that the board has taken positions on first. And uh, then we have a few other uh, new items to update you on after the new bills. So first of all, uh, on the status of bills, uh, the, the notable update is on Senate Bill 1, which is the transportation funding bill that uh, I assume most of you have heard about and have been hearing about um, the bill had is is uh, the uh, proposal that focuses on uh, uh, using general funds to bond and um, that bill had a hearing in Senate committees and debate earlier in the week last week in uh, in on the Senate floor and uh, w was again taken up this evening and um, I'll, I'll pick on our lobbyist, Ed Bowditch, who we just called over from the Senate, who's been <laughs> listening uh, to that debate. Um, so he may or may not have anything interesting to update us on. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have been hearing, and I'm sure many of you also, but we have been hearing uh, a number of different uh, rumors, if you will, or, or reports around the Capitol that um, the uh, 
the uh, House Majority Party may be uh, planning to introduce their own transportation bill. We also have heard that um, the Senate bill, uh, when it gets over to the House, uh, may also be further amended and negotiations may take place and there will be a conference committee and who knows, maybe there will be uh, some sort of compromise that can pass and the governor would even sign. Along the same lines, uh, you've all heard about the uh, uh, funding initiatives that have been filed uh, by a transportation coalition. Uh, there's, there was a conference call of that group this afternoon uh, talking about or making a decision to file uh, at least one additional title. They had previously filed four, and I think they have a deadline today or tomorrow or this end of this week to file any additional titles that potentially could go to the ballot. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, since Ed and Jen, our lobbyists, have stepped up to the uh, podium, uh, unless they need more time to read their notes, uh, I'll uh, see if they have anything to add for us on that. Thank you so much for the invitation to come down tonight. The Senate continues to debate Senate Bill 1. I was summoned here via text message about five minutes ago, but they did adopt the primary amendment, and that was by Senator Rachel Zenzinger of Arvada, um, where it strikes everything in the current bill and replaces it with a new bill where they get $500 million of general fund moving to the Department of Transportation right now, and they go to the voters in 2019, not 2018, but 2019, to request permission to issue bonds, which would be paid back with $250 million of general fund per year. And that's the, that's the real issue, is how much do they want to go to the voters for, ask permission, how much can we do bonds for, and what's the payback requirement. Right now, the Senate adopted, on a strong vote, um, the $250 million a year proposal. Some complain that waiting a year, somebody can come in next year and change that key provision, but everything is subject to change. It will likely get out of the Senate second reading tonight, third reading tomorrow, and go over to the House, where all of this can be changed. There are a number of things we don't know about the bill, but the fact that we're seeing this strong bipartisan support in the Senate indicates that there is some sort of agreement. I don't want to say deal, that has a bad ring to it, but some sort of agreement to get this moving. A um, Couple of things that we know, um, the $250 million dollars that's required each year to repay the bonds, that's really an increase of about $175 million because of some changes in last year's transportation bonding. So to those people who might say we shouldn't bond, take that money potentially out of schools or higher ed or wherever, it's really about a $175 million increase. Um, I believe a lot of this is focused on maybe even exclusively on state transportation projects. It's not a sharing between state, cities, and counties. But again, I haven't seen the specific language. I'm just following what I heard on the Senate floor in the last couple of hours. Um, suffice it to say, a lot can change, but a lot has happened tonight. This bill has been on the calendar for weeks and weeks, and suddenly it's starting to move. Mr. Brockett. It, it, have the dynamics changed since the revised budget forecast identified more money available? Do, yeah. do you feel like that's part of what's broken the logjam yeah. here? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is exactly what's happened. That's a very good question. On Monday, the state revenue estimates were issued, and the Colorado economy continues to race along and the state continues to collect an ever increasing amount of general fund revenues. Um, so much so that one of the forecasts even projects that the state will be at its Tabor limit a year from now. Just eight million dollars over the limit, basically right at the limit, and that eight million could be 40 million down, 50 million up, it's within that range, but nobody ever thought a year ago after Senate Bill 267 reset the Tabor base that we would be approaching that limit. The combination of the federal tax change and the continued strength of Colorado's economy has pushed us up there. But it's given the legislature a lot of other options. I wouldn't have anticipated a week ago that would have said, here's CDOT, here's $500 million of general fund. That wouldn't have happened a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got a couple of people questions, but let me ask for a clarification, if you don't mind, Ed. Now, 
we've heard some rumors about what was going to be proposed by Senator Zinzinger. And as I recall, based upon what version of the rumor you hear, no local share, no multimodal, no transit. It's all CDOT. That's still correct from what you heard at the floor tonight? I believe that's correct. Now, I'd like to think I was told, and again, I don't want to get into too many rumors here, but from what I understand, of the $500 million that's going to CDOT, um, that is state monies. That's for just for state transportation. Right. Of the bonding that would be presented to the voters, there would be up to 10% for multimodal. But again, that's what I've just, that's just what I've heard. Okay. Let me take a couple of questions. Mr. Champion? Yes, thank you. What is, what is your opinion as to why they moved it from 2018 to 2019? Um, I mean, it, it sure sounds political to me. There's a lot that can happen between now and then. Um, a, a, a citizen initiative could go on the ballot this year. That could change the dynamic for 2019. The party control of either house or both house can change. The governor will change. So it could be adjusted or removed. If you have more time, I'm not saying that it will be, but it could be. Um, it's also an off-year election. I haven't, I've never run for office. That, that, can mean, <laughs> that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, whether to put something like that, a bonding measure. It's not a tax increase, but it's permission to bond. Put that on an off-year election. Mr. Partridge. Mm -hmm. So where does uh, 267 lie in this if it goes to two, uh, 2019? Is it still in there? And if it is still in there, does 267 take effect as of what, what, I believe, July 1st? Does it take effect? until this time so is it still in um, the repeal of it I don't know that's a very good question and I don't know there are components of 267 that have proven to be a little harder to implement than originally thought such as the sale and lease back of state buildings and uh, that was supposed to provide some funding for transportation and that's been difficult to do so but I don't know I, I think one of the things that it referred to that bears listening about is that a number of things are still in the presentation and submittal process. Uh, we've all been talking about the coalition that was put together and they had submitted four bill titles. Conversation today was they are going to put together a fifth bill title. The best information I had as of about three hours ago was it's a point three two five point point three two five yeah I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, based upon what the governor is proposing to the budget uh, committee, and that is that the 500 million that Ed referred to is being proposed based upon where we are economic-wise this year as a one-time commitment. That doesn't mean you're going to get 500 again next year. The legislature still has to act on that. That's just a proposal from the governor. I was contacted by the House committee on transportation that they are about to put forward a new bill that we don't know what the content of that is going to be and there's a bunch of moving parts to that so that was something they were working on last week I received a call from them this morning that they were going to put that together hopefully today or tomorrow don't know what the content of that's going to be don't know what impact it's going to have but we also received a call asking that if we would take a formal action to oppose Senate Bill 1 as it was yesterday. <laughs> but then that changed today. So we don't know where they're at. And as uh, Ed and Jen can tell you, I'm not sure either House knows where it's at. Because they have their own prerogatives of where they're trying to go and what they're trying to do. And with Rich down there and the, and the, our two obvious, it's a, it's a circus trying to figure out what <laughs> House and what Senate are doing next. But it's very evident that they are at least having some additional conversation about transportation. And what the governor has proposed is a short time shortening on if it gets proposed. And that $500 million doesn't get split down again with more going to education, which is going to be a big part of the discussions from the budget. House and Senate both is. You can't increase one and leave the kids out. So education is going to get thrown back into this conversation very heavily over the next few days. 
Am I missing something? Yeah, go ahead. No, you're, you're exactly right, sir. And the one other thing I would mention is I sat between 10 o'clock this morning and 5 o'clock this afternoon. The Budget Committee is trying to wrap up its long bill recommendations. And one of the actions they took today unanimously was to reserve $500 million for transportation. They're supposed to finalize all the decisions tomorrow. I don't anticipate that will change based on the way they were talking. So again, when the Budget Committee is doing something consistent with the bills on the Senate floor, um, it sounds like there's the framework of an agreement with lots of details yet to be worked out. But I think that $500 million is going to stay from the Budget Committee's perspective. Okay. Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, um, just to elaborate a little bit more on, on what the Chairman was mentioning, um, the Transportation Coalition, which is um, that, that gr the group that's looking at those, the, the ballot initiative in the fall, um, which is really being led by the Denver Metro Chamber, they had a call at 3 o'clock today um, to talk specifically about the information that Ed sh shared today with regards to what JBC is proposing, as well as the possible changes that may, may occur to S Senate Bill 1. Um, and also based on the information that Ed has shared, it's our understanding as well that that money is really dedicated to the state highway system, right? So the coalition, as, as the chairman suggested, is, is um, uh, planning on filing an additional ballot title that would uh, make, make the locals whole, right? Because in the original proposal, as you recall, it's like similar to 1242 last year, there was 45% of what, whatever the, the sales tax amount or the funding source would be. 45% would go to CDOT, uh, 20 to the counties, 20 to the cities, and then 15% to this mobility pot. So in order to, so that the, the locals would not be left out in the cold in this, they're planning on, on uh, um, uh, uh, filing. Filing. Bill. Filing. 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 Filing a bill, filing the, the ballot initiative that would, um, be 0.35, it's actually 0.35, 0.35% uh, or 0.35 cents, and that would be split 40 to the cities, 40 to the counties, and 20% to the mobility pot. And that, that amount basically mirrors what it would be based on if, um, you know, they were looking at that higher number, I think it was you know, 0.62, 0 .62, yeah. on the, on, based on the 0.62. So the, the cities would get relatively the same amount that they would at the 0.62 level. And the counties and multimodal yes. all would get yeah, roughly all, similar amounts. All those three that are really kind of left out of this, this proposal. And, and so to, to maybe put a fine point on it, too, is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but I think the intent of uh, the decision at that meeting was to still go ahead with the ballot initiative mm -hmm. in, in November. It's just so with to take into account if the legislature and the governor provide this additional funding for bonding then to change the amount that that initiative is going for and to focus it on the local uh, shares and the multimodal. Yep, correct. Okay. Go ahead. So, okay. We will move on. Thank you. Um, and on another uh, budgetary issue, I, I, I want to point out that uh, we were very happy that uh, two weeks ago when the Joint Budget Committee did its figure setting on the Department of Human Services, they did approve uh, our request for a $4 million increase for the uh, area agencies on aging around the state for um, services for older adults. Um, Dr. Cog typically gets around 40% of that money, so I think uh, jail is looking forward to about $1.6 million uh, increase starting July 1st. So we were glad to see that that's moving forward. Um, with that, um, I will move on to our new bills and then the, the handful of other issues uh, that we wanted to present to you tonight. Um, first of all, uh, it's at least it's a short -ish, uh, list. There's only two bills on it. Um, both uh, staff uh, recommendations to oppose. Uh, the first bill uh, changing how the vehicle emissions cycle uh, would be uh, treated um, has, uh, in our view and others, uh, would have negative impacts on um, air, air quality uh, plans in the Denver metro area and would put uh, uh, this region in danger of uh, 
uh, being in violation of uh, our uh, state implementation plan and federal requirements. Uh, and so that's the, really the main reason for opposing that. Uh, the second bill uh, would repeal uh, some of the uh, late vehicle registration fees from the, the faster legislation from 2009. Uh, there have been numerous of these types of bills over the years since 2009, and Dr. Cog has always imposed those, uh, opposed those as, uh, uh, on the basis that we supported to uh, faster and the additional funding uh, for, for roads and bridges that came from that. So with that, I'll see if there's a, a motion or questions or comments. Ms. Jones. Um, I would move that we um, oppose Senate Bill 181 and Senate Bill 196 per the staff recommendation. And I have a second from Mr. Flynn on both. Mr. Wheelock, you have a comment. Okay. Is there any comment or question from any of the directors on the uh, proposal to support the staff recommendation to oppose both uh, Senate Bill 181 and 196? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Have any that abstained? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Staff recommendation is supported. Thank you. Um, the, the next few items uh, listed briefly on the uh, cover mem memo for this uh, uh, board agenda item. Uh, the first one I can be real brief on. Uh, I had wanted to call your attention to uh, an issue that Dr. Cog was going to actually pursue a bill on relating to an unintended con consequence of the uh, mandatory reporting law uh, that was passed a few years ago uh, mandating uh, reporting of uh, um, abuse or neglect or exploitation of, of seniors and uh, disabled at-risk adults basically. Um, in that law it, it defines a, a number, a long list of mandatory reporters, various professions and individuals that, that are required to report. Um, and it includes staff of the Area Agency on Aging, uh, which is not a problem in itself. It also includes staff of contractors of the Area Agency on Aging, which again is also not necessarily the problem. But what is the problem is that uh, it came to our attention that uh, Area Agencies on Aging contract uh, with attorneys to provide legal services uh, for older adults. And, and, and the state and others are interpreting the law to, to make them mandatory reporters, which the lawyers are saying is in direct contradiction to their professional responsibility to maintain a current attorney-client privilege. So we've been asked to, to help uh, go into the law and just carve out a narrow exception uh, for those attorneys. Um, we are um, still working on that. We're still, still trying to find sponsors for that bill. So um, I don't have any more to report on that other than that we're, we're still trying to line up sponsors to move that bill forward. But we may have more for you next month on that. Um, and then the next, the next issue is um, the issue of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail Commission, uh, which you had a uh, presentation on, I believe, last month. And um, there was discussion about a funding proposal that the commission has uh, presented uh, to the legislature. And uh, there was discussion about that, and we're bringing it back to you tonight to, to to consider a little bit more possibly for support of that. Um, that's the handouts that were put uh, on your everybody. chair and your, and, or in front of you. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at that, we also, and, and uh, as you, to remind you, uh, Jacob Rieger on our staff, who has been the uh, vice chair of that, made the presentation last month. We also have Sal Pace uh, here, who has been the chair of that group. Uh, uh, Sal's been up in Denver today, all the way from Pueblo, I believe. Uh, and um, he would be interested in uh, giving you a very short uh, set of comments or answering any questions you, you may have uh, at the uh, board's pleasure. So if, if there's no objection, we'll, we'll ask uh, Sal to just address, address you briefly. Uh, thank you all. I'm a Pueblo County Commissioner and a uh, member of uh, your sister organization, PACOG, Pueblo Area Council of Governments. And I'm also um, one of Doug's new followers on Twitter. <laughs> um, well, now he's got three. That's right. <laughs> I know you're a good people. Uh, 
33, not just three. Um, I come here as the, uh, the chair of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail uh, Passenger uh, Commission. Uh, we were formed, we had a, a prior commission and we've been transformed into a focus on Front Range Rail. And um, we were formed last year by the legislature. One of our missions is to uh, create a uh, phased approach to bringing about Front Range Rail uh, along the I-25 corridor. Uh, we met our statutory obligation and, and presented a, a fairly thorough uh, five-phase approach. Jacob was the lead uh, drafter of that uh, proposal that we presented to the legislature by December 1st, and Jacob is a, a wonderful addition to uh, the commission. All the MPOs up and down the Front Range all have representation uh, on this uh, commission as, as well as three Class One railroads. Um, so. We, we strongly believe that phase one involves an, an aggressive uh, public outreach uh, uh, process. We want to know about uh, station alignments and rail alignments uh, before we uh, ultimately would come to the voters of the Front Range and ask to uh, create some sort of Front Range Rail Commission. We're trying to implement the first phase uh, while the legislature gave us the authority and the direction to uh, move in this direction. The legislature did not give us funding to do this. And so uh, for beginning phase one, uh, we estimated $2.9 million to get us through the year. Um, and uh, Pueblo Area Council of Governments in Pueblo uh, supports the measure Trinidad and South Central COG, your sister agency. Uh, Colorado Springs is in support as well. I know the mayor of Colorado Springs and some other Colorado Springs representatives will be up here lobbying on the matter tomorrow. Um, and what we expect will happen, we, we already have a fund and we don't need to pass a bill, but we expect that one of these transportation measures will end up at some point, um, uh, including uh, funding for our phase one to start the outreach and to look at the uh, very beginning stages of envir environmental work. Um, and it will end up uh, in one of these uh, transportation budget bills, perhaps happening in the Senate. We, we met today, or I met today with the speaker, and she's very supportive of this proposal. Um, however, what I think would be uh, uh, hugely important is if Dr. Cog and the members of this organization uh, supported this, uh, uh, this approach. Um, there we know we have a majority of both chambers who support the concept of rail and front range rail, uh, but there are some folks in key positions who do not. And I think uh, at some point, if, uh, if we're battling it out in some conference committee, having Dr. Cog on board helping out would be hugely helpful. So that's my pitch today, and I appreciate uh, welcoming, me, welcoming me today from, from Pueblo. So I can step back or take questions or let you all get back home to your family and children and spouses. <laughs> Are there any questions for our guests tonight? We appreciate you coming up from Pueblo and hope you enjoy your stay up here in the big metropolis of Denver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Doug, you got something else? Well, no, I, I think at this point we would like some direction from you all about um, how, how you would like to proceed on this request. Any comments or questions? Mr. Brockett. So I, I guess I'm a little unclear about exactly what we would be supporting. So I think, uh, Mr. Pace, you, you didn't mention a specific bill. So can you clarify, please? Yeah, I don't expect a, a specific bill. What I expect is there will be an instrument that includes other transportation funding uh, that in all likelihood will be amended in the House to include the incremental uh, environmental and the outreach funding to uh, uh, craft the future Front Range Rail Authority and District. Um, and so uh, there won't be a bill to support, but there will be a concept to support the um, proposal from the Front Range Rail uh, Commission. So to support the proposal from, from the Front Range yes. Rail? Which for this fiscal year is essentially a $2.9 million request, or uh, one half of 1% of the $500 million being set aside for transportation. Thanks. Well, I mean, I'm happy to make a motion um, that Dr. Cog uh, support the Front Range Rail Commission. We have a second. 
We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion by the board? All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We have uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five abstain. Motion carries. Now, before we get off all this we great one, legislative stuff, I'll we, have one more yeah, for you. We, go ahead, Rick. Okay, and I've got one more. Do you want to do yours oh, first? You go. I, I'm going to save my <laughs> big one till last. Oh, is that okay? So the so we're thinking the same. So we're thing? on the same. We're thinking the same thing. So we're we have one. one one more item, Mickey, uh, that we've actually now called our federal lobbyists to come up and present to us. And I don't know, uh, Mr. Chair or Doug, if you want to uh, introduce it or just let Mickey take the floor. Mickey, I'm going to let you explain it, but let, let me explain what why Mickey's here. Uh, there was a federal bill that was introduced uh, a few days ago with no conversation with the COGS anywhere in the state of Colorado and it's a remake of our TMOs as proposed by a federal legislator from Colorado. So with that and the fact that we've had not had a lot of feedback from the staff of that particular congressman, I'll let Mickey explain what we think the bill is going to do. Great. Um, good evening everybody. Uh, it's uh, I'm a little interesting that we're here and we're going to talk about H.R. 5198. So believe it or not, Congress, as of three weeks ago, had already introduced almost 5,200 bills and they've passed a handful. So you can see how, how well they're doing. Um, so about three weeks ago, I was flying back uh, from a trip on D.C. and I got a panicked several calls from Representative Buck's office trying to give me a heads up that they were about to introduce a, a bill that was going to affect one of my clients, you, Dr. Cog. Um, so we got about 12 hours notice that they were introducing uh, what became HR uh, 5198, and I think you have this, uh, all, all this information, and I'm going to kind of walk you through exactly what the bill does briefly. Basically what it does is it, it amends the FAST Act to change how the membership of an MPO organization works. So how it works now is if an entity wanted to leave this organization, it would take a 75% vote of the membership uh, with an agreement of the governor and then uh, a, a large MPO could be subdivided into smaller regions. So this bill would actually change that 75% threshold down to 50%. Um, and it also adds that if <clears throat> that were to happen, the state would then come in and coordinate the investments among the smaller MPO regions. So it amends Title 23, which is the highway section of the federal uh, code, and it also amends Title 49, which is the transit section because some MPOs actually directly oversee how transit investments take place. So it amends both of those uh, uh, things. So that is what the bill does. The reason I'm here is the, I, every Monday morning I go through all the bills and I look to see if there is any that affect you know, transportation and, and I kind of track those. And, this is normally one I would just add to a spreadsheet and I would say, oh, that's interesting. Um, probably not going to go anywhere. This is really kind of a reauthorization issue. And I really normally would just kind of follow it but not really come here and speak to you. The reason I'm here is because it was a Colorado member who introduced the bill. So that is what makes it a little bit different and ultimately why I'm seeking your guidance in how to communicate on this bill. I have a gut reaction how I think um, we should react to the bill, but really I'm ultimately seeking your guidance in how to communicate to the bill because this is a fairly significant change to how MPOs um, could be formulated or unformulated uh, in federal law. So that's kind of the 50,000 foot um, view of what this bill does. I don't know if Ron or Doug or, or anybody wants to add to that. Um, but I think the, really what I'm seeking is when we have a member of the Colorado congressional delegation introducing a bill 
to change the way the MPOs work. That's a little bit different than what if it were somebody from California, say, introducing a bill. So ultimately, I'm going to seek your guidance in how to uh, communicate with Doug and, and Ron and, and the whole team here about how we communicate with respect to this bill. Mr. Rakowski. I have two questions, and you can take them in either order. Number one is not so much for you, but it is for the jurisdictions seated here tonight that are in Congressional District 4, if you have any wisdom on why this occurred. And then for you, Mickey, the question is, where's Congressman Schuster on this? Um, I doubt Congressman Schuster even knows this bill um, exists. Um, and you and I know that he is the chair of the House Transportation yes. Infrastructure it, Committee. It was referred to his committee um, just this last week, so it did technically dump into the whole list of bills that uh, his committee will eventually deal with. Um, honestly, at, at the government printing site, this bill hasn't even been, a uh, summary hasn't been printed. It hasn't really even been printed. The reason I have a copy is because Congressman Buck's office actually sent me the drafting copy. I even hand wrote the bill number on it. So um, the only reason, this is actually really, you know, I, I doubt the, the chairman actually knows this bill exists. Um, as for the membership, that really I don't think was directed for me maybe. But if he's not in favor of it, it's not going to go anywhere. That I would agree with. I, I think one of the things that we're asking the group to consider is that this was introduced by a congressional member from Colorado. It was not commuted to any of the MPOs in Colorado or asked for input. And we have not been able to ascertain through the Dr. Cog staff the purpose of this, nor who's even asking for it. But as a general thought, I would hope yeah. Uh, that we as an organization, if somebody was upset with how Dr. Cog is put together here regionally, that you'd come talk to people here. But the fact that it's coming through us at a, at a legislative level that's outside of our typical control is very concerning of what is the real driver behind it and who's driving it, because right now we don't know. I've got several. Mr. Partridge, I've got you up. Uh, Ms. Shaw, I've got you up, and I've got uh, Ms. Henry up. So, Mr. Partridge, if you would. Uh, I'd just like to make one point that of uh, the 75% uh, and the existing, or of uh, the existing 75% and the proposed 50%, the largest incorporated city has to be included in that one. Yes. That's a very key thing to know. So I would just make that point known. Now, I will fess up to this. We had conversations with Congressman Buck a few years back, and I think we all know the last tip cycle we went through. There was a little bit of consternation when it went about. It wasn't the first time that occurred. I don't think we were the only county that had consternation about that. Congressman Buck is certainly a very savvy individual. I believe he has had conversations with Chairman Schuster. We have ourselves, too. And so uh, with that, knowing there are other MPOs, especially Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is entirely a different setup, actually has uh, members who aren't even uh, 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 government jurisdictions that are making decisions on transportation. That is driving a lot of it, I believe, too. We have not, and I'll tell you that, we in D Douglas County have not had a conversation with Congressman Buck regarding this as it is presented now. But I will say I think there's some merit to this for us really to think about, grab more information, understand this better, because when we really see what we went through a couple years ago, it was a real challenge for it. Now, we're largest MPO, split our MPO, no doubt create challenges for staff, even though I think the same amount of staff would be hired in a situation if there is multiple MPOs. But seeing that we even do have differences a couple years ago, that was a real issue. I will fess up to that, and I don't think I'd be the only one to fess up to that. Now, bring us where we are today, now that we have the regional, sub-regional, a lot different setting who we are, what we are, even though there may be some that still don't like it, would say, hey, maybe we're considering going. I think we ought to continue to ask questions. I propose that we do not take a motion on, let's just gather more information, really become informed what this is, what it really means, instead of saying one of our congressmen who has been very active and very supportive of transportation where a couple years ago he wasn't and from Lone Tree they will say that that he was a very big proponent for light rail to Lone Tree actually making direct calls so 
I would just propose that we just kind of get more information on this before we go too aggressive. Ms. Shaw. I think that course of action makes sense to me to gather more information, but I am concerned on a couple of points. Even when you're changing bylaws in an organization, it takes more than a majority vote to make a change, and this would be a significant change to any MPO if, if uh, it became simply a majority vote. So um, that to me is a, a kind of a cautionary flag. Um, I guess my point of confusion, and maybe we can get some clarification on this as well, um, to have the state oversee something I, I don't understand how that jives with the Local Control Act. It seems like it's taking control away from the localities. So, so the state would be the coordinating entity among the sub-regional investments. So uh, let's just say uh, the big pie got split into three smaller pies. And then the state would then coordinate how the three smaller pies invested so that there was some sort of coordination because you still live within the big pie itself if that make does that help kind of it it helps me it understand bit? how it would function but i think it actually takes local control away just my you know point of view on it um, we at this point would be making decisions among ourselves um, and and we would give up that right to do so. I mean, uh, to your point, I think I would just reverse how I explained it, is that you all live within a big entity and how those investments are coordinated amongst that big entity probably is most efficiently decided within that big entity, not in the three smaller groups. But that that is the question of the bill, right? Sure. It is is yep. that is sort of where the bill goes is, um, do you do this bill would make it easier for entities in larger regions to subdivide themselves for investments? Okay. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Henry. Well, Congressman Buck actually represents part of Adams County. We often tease him that he represents more cows than he does people in that area. Um, but uh, my, I, we have a federal lobbyist ourselves. We'll definitely be checking into this in Adams County to see what his thought is. I kind of agree with Roger. I think we need to ask some questions of the congressman and maybe start working with him and maybe address some of those concerns he might have. Ms. Jones. Um, I'm willing to defer to the um, prior speakers around a course of action that doesn't involve taking an immediate position. I have to say it is always very disappointing when a member of Congress introduces legislation that directly impacts an entity without consultation with that entity and I have no problem with indicating our surprise and chagrin that that indeed took place and you could do that in a very respectful manner. But I also, um, this seems like a um, solution in search of a problem and I think I think um, I've heard that from other folks, but I'm not sure the impetus for this, and I guess maybe, you know, Douglas County's conversation with Congressman Buck several years ago was the source of that. It would be, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know why we would want this, this bill now. I don't see what we're, what's trying to be accomplished, and I, I think engaging um, the office in a dialogue about why and suggesting that at least at this point this body doesn't see a need for that so th those are my thoughts Ms. Dolson thank you I I'm very supportive of uh, director Shaw's comments things there are times when a supermajority is is a very good thing so that you're just not um, dividing your group into smaller and smaller sections and everyone taking their bat and ball and going home it's, it's a very divided time in our country, and this is just deciding the boundary of where our metropolitan area is. Um, this is not something that we, that I've heard anybody at this table talk about wanting to do, and I would hope we would talk about it amongst ourselves before we would suggest to one of our 
congressional representatives that we need them to take care of it for us because we can address a lot of issues between each other. So that would be my thought. I am concerned that it sends a superficial signal at least that there is something wrong. Um, you know, and that's you know, sort of problematic to me. That, it, that It's really just at the superficial level. So it would be nice, in my opinion, to state at least that we didn't, um, that this is not something that's that we have asked for is, or is necessary for our particular organization, that there's nothing that we've identified that would cause this to need to happen. I don't object to monitoring it and getting more information, but I think we should sig send a signal that we're fine and we don't need this to carry on. Mr. Pfeiffer? So, so I agree that there's, it's a solution to finding a problem. Uh, here, here's how I look at this. The way you described it is what we're already doing. We have subregions, little circles as you put it, and we have Dr. Cog, which in your story is the state. So do we want the state to get into our subregions and start getting into that, that pool? I, I think we're already working very proficiently. We're already working collaboratively. I think bringing the state into those conversations, if that was how it's being proposed, just further um, removes our local control. So we're kind of already doing it. And I think we need to get through our cycles and uh, enjoy our successes. I'm leaning towards opposing it because it, this is just legislation that doesn't need to be there because there's not a problem here. So those are my thoughts. Ms. Birkin Smith. So Mickey, I'm just wondering, um, there are five MPOs in the state of Colorado, um, and there's another one within his district. I'm just wondering if you've had any input from other MPOs. Um, how do I do this delicately? Um, so yes, um, I've had multiple conversations with Congressman Buck's office um, in, in trying to ascertain a motivation, one, for the bill, but two, the, the contemplation of how it would affect, you know, multiple MPOs, not only within the state, but nationally as well. Um, there was some contemplation of that. Um, and and I, th I think the reaction may have sort of caught them off guard a little bit to be to be to be fair. Um, this is a fairly significant change to what the current law is. And and you got to you have to remember that one MPO just doesn't look like every other MPO around the, the country. It, it, there's a whole vast universe out there. And um, this takes a, a big macro look at it in trying to do a big macro fix. Uh, so one of the things we intend to do, Doug and I have had lots and lots of conversations uh, about this bill over the last uh, couple of weeks, is that we do intend, I believe, to go to um, the next region uh, at, at STAC, the, the MPO meeting that, Doug, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, well, actually, um, our next statewide um, MPO Friday. meeting is tomorrow, and it is on the agenda for discussion. Excellent. So there you Yes. Deborah, go ahead. It's actually on Friday. I'm sorry, that's correct, Friday. Um, the, the other thing to note is I know that the Colorado Division of FHWA is, is aware of this bill. Um, they are also asking questions. Um, so at some point, we will all be asked that question uh, as well. So um, just a, a, a contemplation. Other comments or questions from the floor at this point? Ms. Christman. Listening to Roger, it sounds to me like they may be trying to solve a variety of problems perhaps in other jurisdictions around the country, and they're taking a baseball bat to something that probably needs a few tweezers. So um, I would, I mean, if your dog has fleas, you don't kill it. You deal with the fleas. <laughs> so um, I, I, would, uh, I would be inclined, although I don't think we should vote on it tonight, but to let make them understand that we're very cautious about this because it may have a lot of unintended consequences. Other comments from the floor? Mr. Partridge, go ahead. And I certainly will reach out to Congressman Buck to explain what we've done with our regional, some regional approach, and maybe that is something he can take the other regions around the country 
uh, even though we're in the early stages, no doubt. But I certainly will reach out to Kent, Congressman Buck also and just for clarity and, and understanding on that, let him know it wasn't us or some of the others, I think, at the table that were dissatisfied at present. So it was kind of a shock to all of us as Doug, Doug and I had the conversation. He called me right away. I played the Colonel Schultz. I know nothing. <laughs> so let me let me try to bring Let's us back. On. Based upon the discussion, we've uh, we, what we've had comments about is one to oppose, two to get more data, and to politically correctly send Mickey back with a hammer. Very nice one, and let them know that we are very concerned about what this action is that they're proposing and uh, try to figure out if there's a reason why and based upon what they find out bring us back that additional information and see if we need to take a more formal action at that time so I have on one hand oppose is there anyone in uh, favor of coming tonight with a position of opposing the bill based on what you know right now okay that one goes away. Just by a show of hands, those in favor who would like us to gather more data, confer with the office of uh, Congressman Buck, and try to come back and get us more data and try to be more proactive about letting them know where we currently stand. Is that okay with everyone? Just the hands? Yeah, you can vote once. That's only once. <laughs> All right. So. Mickey, would you please uh, just go back and see what you can figure out with them, uh, provide the information to Rick and, and Doug, and then that way if there's something that needs to be committed, communicated out to the group, we can get that out through a, an email as quickly as possible. But we want to make sure we understand what's the reason behind it, what's the purpose of it. But at this point, the, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is very concerned about this proposed measure. Great. Thank you for your guidance. <laughs> Mr. Morrow, you have anything else legislative? No. All right. <laughs> Moving on to item 13, I believe, is where we're going. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rex. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me see here now. So, you know, it really does suck to be the last major agenda item on the agenda, especially for something as, as as important as this. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little concerned about Mayor Chris, Chrisman and her baseball bat, so I'm gonna try to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, right. So the topic for conversation today um, is uh, regional share criteria. I know we've been talking about it for quite some time, that we're gonna get it to you, and we're to that point now. So we, uh, um, so l let's get after it. So decisions to date, I always like to show this because I mean I know we're all seems like we've been doing this forever but we have accomplished quite a bit over the last year or so. Um, specifically you know we, we established the set-asides, the, the, the board approved the focus areas back in September, um, then in January we had a very big meeting where we established um, you know what uh, you know, the types of projects and program, programs uh, that would be eligible for uh, for the regional share and then of course the funding split was also discussed at that meeting and we all know that this is uh, how it turned out again this is only in draft form proposed that's my disclaimer we still still don't know exactly how much money we're going to be getting um, but just FYI so the so the, really the two major decisions we still have left before we can get into uh, the calls for projects later on this summer are um, this is not this slide. This also, this was last month, we approved this, um, the uh, sub-regional form governance concepts, which allowed us to then send out formal invitations to the sub-region members. And we're in the process of doing that right now. We sent out three today that we have dates for, which is Douglas County, Jefferson County, and Weld County. Um, and we will be sending out the remainder of those uh, here, hopefully by the end of the week, once we've established the, uh, the uh, the next sub-regional forum meetings. So just FYI on that. So you look forward to that. 
Um, so our next steps, we really have two major important milestones that we still have to get by before we can finish up the TIP policy document and um, then do the calls for projects later on this summer. The one of which we're going to have a, um, a preliminary first initial discussion about this evening is the regional share criteria and then ultimately the uh, sub-regional share criteria. So the regional share criteria that you have in front of you this evening, um, you know, a couple things I would like to point out in this. Um, we, I believe we received, you know, we got some direction, and this is really from the, you know, the tip postmortem from, uh, from the last tip call when we talked to you all about, you know, we'd really like to have, you know, explore a different process, which of course we did, and we're headed down that direction. But we also, there was also comments about, you know, trying to simplify the process, right? So I think what we've, we've attempted to do in this criteria, in the regional share criteria, is create an environment which we really are, are um, um, requesting the applicant to be able to basically build a case for why their project, with the limited monies that we have in this region, why that project should be funded. Right, so um, you know, and and you know, in the past, it's been you know very, very rigid criteria that we use. I think this process is kind of a qualitative process that must be backed up with quantitative evidence, and it, but it allows for their it, it, for the project to be viewed in some contextual relationship, right? So it's 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 um, so we we think it's a pretty good mix where we're going. So the framework really is in three parts, right? There's this basic information section, then the real meat of it is in part two, which is, has the evaluation criteria, and then part three is kind of calculation worksheets that you can use um, for various metrics to be able to uh, provide the, uh, the uh, necessary evidence for your claims in your narrative as part of part two. So the basic information, this is, you know, obviously name, location, what it is you plan on doing, all that kind of good stuff. But the big thing in this section is the problem statement. What problem are you, I say you the applicant, trying to solve or mitigate as a result of the project? Um, you know, that is something, quite frankly, we've never really asked before, right? I mean, I think that's, it's obviously very important that if we're, if we're using federal money to, uh, to um, uh, fund a project that we have a clear understanding exactly what the heck it is we're trying to solve. So we made sure that that was right up front and, um, um, uh, you know, that was, it was, it was given weight within, within, the, within the documentation. So the second part, and this is where, um, uh, you know, really, again, like I said, where the meat of it is. So there's four sections within part two. Um, and I probably I'll take them one by one here. So in 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 the regional significance section, part, part two a, um, we're really trying to get a grasp on um, the regional significance of the project that you project or program or study that you're you're planning on submitting. So we straight up ask you what you believe, why you believe this project is regionally significant, um, and that. You know, and really, again, this is, you know, we're, we're modal agnostic when it comes to this stuff. So you have to be able to explain to us, when I say us, I don't know who us is, us staff and this panel that we're planning on creating. And that's for another meeting, by the way. We'll talk about that. Um, that you, you should be able to, um, to articulate the reason why this project should be funded. So we've talked about this, and the board, uh, you know, you guys have given us head nods that, you know, Projects that cross um, uh, or benefit multiple municipalities and or regions is something that you believe um, sh you know, is, is, should be given extra weight in, in, the, in the calculations of, of how this is done or should be considered significant in, in um, um, you know, this, the selection or ranking or priorities of projects. Um, also, uh, it, how, this, uh, how this project will solve a specific transportation problem and, uh, and how it connects to the different travel, travel modes. And project program partnerships, of course, as well. That's, that's part and parcel for, uh, with uh, bullet two, really. So that's part A, regional significance. This, the part 2B is related to the TIF focus areas. And we've had plenty of discussions about this. So the question will be asked how your project program or study will help address the, uh, um, the TIP focus areas that were approved by the board back in the fall. And those, those uh, three, again, is to improve mobility infrastructure for vulnerable populations, 
increase the reliability of the transportation network, and improve safety and security. Now, it's not, a, it's not proposed that your project program or study will have to uh, be able to, um, to accommodate all three of these focus areas, but um, it certainly should, at, at a minimum, be able to address one. 2C, consistency with MetroVision objectives. So we have regional significance that will be scored on. It will have, we have the focus areas to be scored on. And then we also, um, as we've always talked about, there needs to be a consistency with the tenants of MetroVision. So the tenants that are located up here had, um, are related to, you know, there's uh, how many objectives, Brad? Brad is not here. We got a lot of objectives. These are primarily related. These, these are transportation related ones to some degree. Um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So there's eight of those. And um, so we're requesting that, that, um, that your project program or study show how your project will help advance these MetroVision themes, or sorry, MetroVision ob objectives. Again, it is not anticipated that your project program or study will be able to accommodate all four, all eight of these. But, um, uh, you know, again, we would, we would hope that, um, you know, it, your project would be able to fulfill a number. Um, and again, so I, I mentioned, you know, this qualitative part, and this is really, this is this narrative that, that you can show and can build the contextual concept or, or you know, what is it? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Context sensitive solutions. That was it. I know. So I, I, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, that we, we included that in how, how you guys would submit projects. So that's the qualitative side. But if you say that your project will increase access to amenities um, or improve access to opportunities or improve the region's competitive uh, position, we would hope you would be able to provide the necessary metrics from a quantitative perspective to back up that claim. Uh, last but not least in section 2 is uh, 2D leveraging and this is primarily the overmatch so we've always talked about these regional projects that you know is kind of the last money in kind of concept that there these be these larger projects but not necessarily it doesn't have to be but it was always assumed that the um, that the majority of those that would be submitted would be uh, would fall in that that kind of concept so um, so yeah, so, so, so projects that have a higher match percentage will, um, will in turn be, uh, be scored um, uh, higher in this category. And uh, part three, as I always, uh, also, uh, well, I've, I've already mentioned, is, um, is kind of the worksheets associated with this. Um, these are the examples of metrics that you might use in order to build your case and evidence for, for your project. Um, you know, quite frankly, if you're, you know, if you're, you or your staff um, feels they have better metrics they would like to use to do that. Uh, we would we would certainly welcome those, but we would indeed you know, we want to make sure that what you are presenting to us, if it's not these metrics, that is something that we can replicate as staff to make sure that what you're providing is indeed accurate. So um, uh, so yeah, so that's that's basically it. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. I'd really just like to get your general reaction to this concept and where we are with it today. We are, our next TIP policy work group meeting is um, this coming Monday. So, um, you know, any, any comments or suggestions you might have for uh, improving this, this criteria, um, we'd be happy to hear that. We, uh, so we will plan on bringing this back to you again at your April work session, April 4. And then we, we fully anticipate um, having something finalized and ready for for your action at the April meeting so this uh, I know it's a heavy lift but I think we just we need to get going on this stuff just a comment and I'll come to you Michelle that what we're what we're looking at with this is to get the process started and we're giving you a starting point you can add to it within your sub regional areas uh, as Doug indicated we will provide more guidance for you at the sub regional area uh, later on but we're looking at projects being presented in late July, early August. So we're not giving you a lot of time. Uh, for those of you from Adams County, you should be getting your letter for the formation of that group this week. Uh, that first kickoff group was uh, held with the commissioners yesterday. So all of you that uh, have boundaries within Jeff Adams County should get your letter hopefully by Friday at the latest, yeah. maybe maybe Monday, yeah. Because Doug doesn't type very fast. 
So to that point, uh, I've got Miss Elrod. I got it down. I wrote it down somewhere. I couldn't remember it. Miss Shaw, I've got you up, and then Miss Miss Elrod, please. Thank well, you so. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Which who's first? first? Ladies. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> I'll be quick because I think I just answered my own question. Um, was there any consideration in the weighting of the different criteria? And I actually do see that that was in play. You know, that, uh, th thank you for bringing that up because, quite frankly, I meant, I meant to uh, ask that question for discussion. Um, what's proposed on here now, and it's simply obviously a proposal, is that um, the regionally significant section would be, so they would be weighted differently, the four sections in part two. So the regional significance portion, the first portion would be rated at 40% because this is a regional share pot. So the, the, the concept as discussed by the TIP Policy Work Group is that that one should be weighed the highest. The, the, the TIP focus areas, which I know are a focus of you all, we believe that should be ranked, uh, weighted uh, the second highest at 30%. Then the uh, Metrovision objectives would be 20%. And then uh, the, uh, the overmatch or the leveraging portion at 10%. Um, I would be interested to get your reaction to that as well. Ms. Shaw? Yes, thank you. Um, I like not only those percentages, but the, the fact that we are uh, demonstrating how we're tying it to MetroVision and also um, you know, backing up our, our claims of how we're, we're doing it. One thing that I would love to see on the basic information page is simply a list of the funding partners and maybe their percentages. I just think it would be easy reference. No, thank you. Good information. Mr. Brockett. Well, Doug, I think you all have put together a great framework here, so I think we're definitely on the right track. Um, and then the just one comment on the percentages. I think it might be useful to have a higher percentage for the Metro Vision objectives. So, I mean, that, that's what we've all agreed to, the direction we want to see our region going in. And at 20 percent, uh, you know, you could do great on all the other things but not meet the Metro Vision objectives and still potentially place really quite high. So that's just some feedback there. Thank, thank you. Ms. Perkins-Smith, did you have a comment? No, nope. Ms. Jones. Um, yeah, I, I think generally this is heading in the right direction. I always get a little bit nervous about qualitative versus quantitative. I think we really need to be data driven. And going back to the last tip cycle, the part that wasn't hard was the 75% of the tip that went to scored projects. We decided the criteria ahead of time. They were scored, easy peasy. Good projects did well, and you know, you might wish your project did better, but it was, that's not what we had brain damage over. It was the 25% where we qualitatively tried to apply criteria. That hurt. That was painful, and that took forever. So I, I really want to emphasize the importance of having quantitative data metrics behind every qualitative statement, because that's really important. And I would also agree with Director Brockett of you know, the metro vision is sort of the heart and soul of, of what we unanimously adopted for our region. And so making sure that regional projects go back to our regional vision makes a whole lot of sense. So I would score that higher. Yep. Thank you. We'll take it back. Other comments? Again, this will, this will start to form the basis for the sub-regional project evaluations as well. So the data you gather for your projects doesn't get just used once. It'll be looked at multiple times. Any other comments or feedback to staff at this point? You will be seeing this again in the very near future. Yes, Ms. Elrod. I have another one. Um, and I, this might be unique to us. So I received, of course, three invitations, Arapahoe County, Jefferson County, and Douglas County. You're welcome. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody want to come? <laughs> there's, there's multiple. Uh, I will tell you just it, Rita gets to go not only Boulder County, but Jefferson County. Because ten percent of your no, community. they just canceled my invitation. They did. They asked me to come, and then they canceled it right after that. Who did that? Stay with and, them. And <laughs> so, so the question there is, um, if we have a project that crosses all three of those sub-regional, would it be? How do we present it? Is it presented as one, or do each of the sub-regions present it? And maybe you don't have an answer yet, but something to think Can about. Can you repeat that again? I didn't catch So 
will, as the city of Littleton, will sit in all three yes. of the subregions, and there may be a project that affects all three of mm -hmm. those subregions. Where do we bring it from? Which subregion do we bring it forward, or how do we bring it forward from all three? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and we have actually uh, Director Flynn uh, brought that up a few work sessions ago. Um, it's a very good question. I think, you know, I, the way I probably answer that is that we believe it'll probably form organically. <laughs> Maybe that's not the right way to to do that. Um, however, you guys are in a pretty unique situation in which you guys could almost, you could be the catalyst for that, right? Because you do share membership on three regional forums, but or sub-regional forums, but we realize that's probably not the best solution. Um, so that's probably something we'll have a conversation about. But I would suggest, like I, I think I, I had mentioned, I think I had mentioned it to the board. I know I talked to Tip Policy Work Group about it, about like in uh, Puget Sound Regional Council, um, they hold a, a monthly meeting of all the chairs of the sub-regions. So there's probably a possibility there, there's opportunity for them to, you know, to have discussion about those projects that might cross. So we, we could possibly do something like that as well. And, and to your point, uh, Aurora's another one. Mm -hmm. Multiple counties. Uh, myself, I sit in two. Arvada's got two. Uh, Rita's got two. Several of us have two counties that our municipal boundaries sit in. So it's going to be an issue of when you have a local project, which one do you play in? Well, which one has the most part of that project in what region? Could be one of your deciding factors. So, Mr. Deal? Mr. Chairman, I, I look at the leveraging and I say that, that looks good in one way, but in the other way, it might be the rich get richer. And it reminds me of the one of the federal proposals of a five to one match. So right. I think it's worth considering and thinking about. Well, I think one of the things you have to keep in mind too, each region is going to have a pot. If you look at the breakdown, you've got a, the bot, pot breaks down by region. You've got to work with your partners within that region to come up with an agreement. That agreement then comes forward here for final blessing. And if, I would tell you if there's not consensus among the group, you need to go back and talk to each other before you come here. Because the last place you want is this group having to make your local decision for you. Director Dale, I, m I might say that, um, I, I, and it's a great thought, and we, we, you know, TIP Policy Group Work Group is very sensitive to that, and I tell you that's the reason why it's only weighted at 10 percent, because there was fear that, you know, some of our smaller communities would not be able to come up with that regional match. The other thing I might point out, though, this is only for the regional share, right? So each subregion um, has the ability to submit only up to three projects. So I would suggest that those projects are probably going to be, you know, ones in which there's you know, multiple communities that are maybe putting, yeah, putting, you know, money, match money in or, you know, these larger projects, right? So, yeah, but it's a great thought. I appreciate it. All right, any other feedback from the staff at this point? If not, let's move on to item 14, uh, report of the committee chairs. Ms. Jones, the stack. So the stack two got a presentation on the Olympic Exploratory Committee. Those folks are nothing if not thorough. Um, we also discussed um, the performance measure targets that the FAST Act requires. We adopted our safety targets. There's two other sets of performance measures that have to be adopted by CDOT and Dr. Cog, and that's infrastructure condition and system performance. So we'll be doing that later this year. Um, we continued work on developing the development program list. We've already done that for highway projects. Now we're doing it for transit projects with the goal of getting it done by the end of the summer. So it'll be relevant for any ballot initiative. Um, CDOT's also working with the Attorney General to update the model traffic code. And um, we got an update on the uh, FY19 CDOT budget. Those are sort of the highlights of the meeting. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Partridge, if you would. Actually, I refer to Director Jones. I was not at the match she was, but it sounds like it might be a... a Guess what we got to hear about. Yes. <laughs> the Olympic Exploratory <laughs> Committee strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Warren, would you please? I'll leave the Metro Mayor till last. So... In the area agency on aging, uh, we invite contractors that we fund to come and talk with us. Uh, periodically, we ask Senior Reach 
uh, to come and talk with us. They provide mental health services to Jefferson, Gilpin, and Clear Creek. Um, they've had some uh, significant cha staff changes and have lost a, a national designation uh, that, that was very beneficial to them, uh, uh, a certification in mental health. Uh, I was worried about them. I'm no longer worried about them. I feel like they're getting good service. I really like their answers, their future um, plans. Uh, they'd like to expand. They were very excited that it looked good. We were going to get like more money at the state level, hoping that we would uh, find our way to give more mental health uh, dollars to them. Uh, Douglas County really wants to uh, uh, expand the senior reach model or senior reach and Douglas County would like to partner in uh, we're going to see if we can work on that a little bit the other thing I we talked about in in quite uh, detail is the new assisted living regulations and I'm telling you this because you're our board but also because you may be approached or asked about this issue um, there are new assisted living regulations uh, being proposed our uh, ombudsman program manager Shannon Gimbel led a three-year effort to revise the the assisted living regulations. There were multiple work groups. Um, all all sorts of people came, and no one was excluded. What you will hear from the 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 association of it's called CALA, the Colorado Association of Assisted Living Facilities. They are they represent the smaller lists, assisted living facilities, those are like 14 and under. They will tell you that these regulations will put them out of business. Um, they will tell you that it will close Medicaid um, facilities in in the state of Colorado, and and they use uh, the fact that six facilities have been closed in the metropolitan area since the first of the year. Um, four of those were closed because of really bad care and two of them were closed uh, for redevelopment issues um, or they're, they're being there's a new model one's being scraped and going to be made condos and the other one is changing from assisted living to an independent living option um, th that's the provider side of the story um, we don't believe that's true and we strongly support these regulations um, the things that they're most concerned about are um, we're requiring a, a, a degree, a bachelor's degree in a related field or 40 hours of training. Um, they say that's unreasonable. Let me tell you that a nail technician, someone who does fingernails, is required to have 750 hours of training before they can be certified. Um, they're worried about having uh, regular checks during the night on residents who require that. Uh, so we, we weren't able to get awake staff, but at night, um, those folks who have wandering risks should be checked on. And um, the health department presented three pages of stories of people who died or were injured because they weren't checked on. Um, and you will hear that we are requiring, or these regulations are requiring, commercial kitchens, which isn't true at all. And so, um, and and uh, stringent nutrition standards. There are none now um, in the regulations. Absolutely none. Um, so, uh, pr defining what you know is a, a nutritious meal is is where they're going, and that's all. They're not requiring anything else. So, I want you to be aware of that. Because, and if you have any questions or you get approached by some of these folks in our community um, and have questions, please uh, give me or, or Shannon Gimbel a call and we'll be happy to tell you our side of the story, representing the consumer interest. Um, the other thing, we had senior, a senior day at the Capitol and the governor came and the lieutenant governor and Mayor Hancock, all of them talked about Dr. Cog. All of them, uh, the governor said, and we've got Boomer Bond. Um, when somebody asked him, asked him about livable communities, I couldn't. I was just. I could have flown out of there. I was so excited. Um, we were. Uh, we are definitely seen as leaders in the state uh, around aging, and it makes me really, really happy. Um, and we've got uh, clearly a lot of respect 
I don't know if Rich is, yeah, Rich is still here. Um, Rich has a ton of respect uh, down at the Capitol, and uh, it was just really, it hasn't always been that way, has it, Rich? <laughs> when it came to aging, so we're really excited. Okay, thanks, Jayla. Mr. Rex, Rack. Thank you, sir. Um, well, last month, I think in, in this report, I, I mentioned to you that Ken Lloyd, the only executive director um, that Rack has ever had, is, is retiring this summer. Well, it was a little premature. He's uh, now plan He's willing to stay on through the end of the year. And uh, I think the, the board sees this as an opportunity to, uh, to do a transition plan uh, for, for the new person that comes on. But also, they're going to do some strategic, uh, some strategic planning um, associated with that kind of mission, you know, mission vision type stuff that we, we did a couple, couple three years ago. Um, I know uh, uh, Director Jones is sitting on that committee. I don't know if there's any update that you want to share, uh, Elise. Um, that it, the committee is meeting now and we'll be um, looking to bring somebody on board by late summer is the current thinking. Okay, Mr. Rakowski, E-470. I am honored to continue to represent this board before the E-470 board in fulfilling our statutory duties. I have no other report. <laughs> Well, Mr. Van Meter's not here, so we can't pick on him. Well, we could, but that, I don't know if it <laughs> wouldn't be as beneficial. Uh, from Metro Mayors, to give you a short update, a group called Colorado Concern has uh, proposed or is trying to propose a specific ownership tax, which Metro Mayors has been meeting with them on. This is on the vehicle registration. Uh, what I will tell you is that Metro Mayors has taken a very strong position of no on this, but we are continuing to talk to them to see if we can get them to see some light. And we will continue to talk to them as uh, Ms. Christman, Rakowski, and myself have been part of that group. We also are working with the Colorado Coalition on the potential of that fifth ballot title. Uh, we have a call with, uh, I'm trying to remember, we have another call with them in the next couple of days. Uh, we are also taking a contingent of the mayors down to meet with the Colorado Concern Group to keep communication going with them to see if we can get them to understand that this is really not anything because that SOT tax would go strictly to CDOT. No share, no mobile, multimodal, no transit, and no con uh, coverage through local. So those are some of the things that the Metro Mayor's uh, Transportation Group is working on. We have a, another meeting of the coalition coming up here in a uh, week or two uh, through the executive committee. But uh, other than that, it's still trying to play watchdog with what's happening and what the impact is to our local communities on these tax bills that are being proposed for transportation. So if, uh, if there's any other questions, uh, Ms. Christman and Mr. Murkowski can answer all detailed questions right after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> on the way to the car. Is there any uh, other items for the good order of the business? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Ladies and gentlemen, travel home safely. Ms. Baca. You stick around. Thank you. Oh.